This is Martin Scorsese, and I'll be talking about my film of Nikos Kazantzakis' The Last Temptation of Christ. I had always wanted to make um, a film about the life of Christ ever since I became enamored of the old Hollywood biblical epics that I saw when I was a child. And then when I was in film school, I imagined the only way I could possibly do it would be as a sort of black and white cinema verite version in modern dress. But this sort of went by the wayside when I saw Pasolini's great film, The Gospel According to St. Matthew. Once I decided to film Kazantzakis' novel, it certainly was a long and very frustrating process to get the production going. Originally, I was set to make it for Paramount Pictures back in 1983. And instead of a traditional epic film, I planned an intimate character study, which meant it could be filmed on a small budget. I began extensive research and location scouting in Morocco and Israel with the great production designer Boris Levin. By September, the sets in Israel had been built and the film was cast, but the production kept getting bigger and the budget rose to about $16 million, which was pretty substantial for that time. At that point, the moral majority in America had heard about it and began to send protest letters into the studio. Eventually, the largest American theater chain, United Artists, told Paramount Pictures that they would not show the picture because they were worried about the audience response. And caught between this religious and financial pressure, Paramount finally canceled the film on Thanksgiving Day of 1983. I then realized that if the film were ever going to be made, the budget would simply have to be cut in half, just returning to the simplest style it originally intended, incorporating the production techniques used in uh, Rossellini's Italian films for Rai Television. You take advantage of a certain look in a certain part of the world, almost like a newsreel, shooting in ruins, etc., using whatever already exists in that country. And so we spent the next four years trying to get funding from Hollywood studios and various independent sources. Finally, in 1987, Mike Ovitz uh, set up a picture deal at Universal Studios. We began shooting at the end of October, bringing back most of the original cast. Now, the plan was to shoot the film mainly in Israel originally. It was too expensive. So we shot the film instead completely in Morocco with a budget of only $7 million all in. Over the years, I'd worked with uh, Jay Cox on several revisions of the original screenplay, which uh, was written by Paul Schrader back in 1983. I asked Paul to write the screenplay originally because we had very close affinities and I, I thought it would be interesting to see um, a Calvinist approach to the book. The novel is long and complex and Paul had been able to pare it down to an excellent 90-page script in just four months. Uh, I'm Paul Schrader. I was the adapter of the Kosenzakis novel, The Last Temptation of Christ. The book is not a, an immediate or accessible read. The power of the book is uh, largely in, in the ideas and the sort of principal idea of Christ as a re representative of the human struggle you know, for salvation. But my first uh, strong feeling was that Jesus was lying on a rocky hillock with a splitting migraine and that God, in fact, was a vicious headache that would not go away. And uh, that became, you know, the first image of the film. As I proceeded to outline the story, that issue, God as the, as the ultimate headache, started to inform how the story would go and how Jesus, the character, as opposed to Jesus, the Godhead, would address this evolving relationship with God the Father, God the Headache. And, uh, you know, at various stages, he thinks that uh, God is love or that uh, God is uh, an act, is, is, is violence. And then finally he comes to the realization that God must be the sacrifice, he must be the lamb. And it was quite a formidable challenge because 600 plus page book, which is uh, full of incident and detail and philosophy, and essentially a rather uh, mystical book. So what I did was that I took a week off and went to La Costa and uh, read and reread the book. And I made a list of every single thing that happened in the book. And then started checking off all of the incidents with regard to various themes and uh, plots. 
themes about humanity, divinity of Christ, uh, themes involving the disciples, uh, the Magdalene, various theological issues that were being raised. And then just uh, checking off things in terms of general interest, how much they interested me or how much uh, they drove the story along because I knew that I would have to condense it a great deal. So uh, I, I tried to winnow it down to, you know, 50 or so essential things. I think in, in most movies, somewhere between 45 and 55 things actually happen apart from entrances and exits and so forth. So I wanted to get it in that time range. So a couple choices were made at this time. One was that the story at a character level was essentially a triangle with uh, Jesus, the Magdalene, and Judas. So those would be my three central characters and that anything pertaining to the other characters was less important. Uh, the way Cousin Zach has created the character of Jesus at this point in the story is that he knows there's something that's wanted from him, but he doesn't want any part of it. So he does something that's so bad that it would keep God away from him, you know. And he doesn't want to be plagued by God. By There's a poem called Hound of Heaven that uh, people try to pull away from religion or uh, God and uh, the Hound of Heaven trails after them. There's always their nagging way. And consciousness, maybe that's more for a Roman Catholic, I don't know. But in any event, the way Cousin Zacchaeus envisioned it was to have Jesus at the beginning of the story uh, doing such, such horrible things to his, to his own people uh, as to be a person who's reviled and uh, considered a great sinner. Also, a decision was made to go for the more Western elements of Cousin Zacchaeus thinking. Scorsese's Roman Catholic background, I'm Dutch Calvinist. Kazanzakis uh, was Greek Orthodox, but with a heavy influence from the East. And you could take the story, the book, either way. The natural choice was to take it uh, in our direction in terms of uh, Western culture. I found a quote from another book by Kazanzakis called Saviors of God. And I put this quote on my outline sheet. And that quote would drive the decisions of what to put in and what to take out. And I'm not quoting it exactly, but the quote said, in effect, uh, it is not God who finds us, it is we who find God through struggling, striving, etc. And this notion that we come to God informs the book and therefore would inform the character of Jesus who would be a metaphor and when critics of the film accuse it of blasphemy they are right in a way they are right at a highly intellectual level not at a kind of visceral superficial level to use Jesus Christ as a character as a metaphor for the human condition is technically a form of blasphemy since as God, how can he be a metaphor for man? But, you know, that's also the conundrum of Christianity because uh, it contends that uh, Christ was both fully human and fully divine. And, uh, that has caused the church no small amount of trouble over the years. And whenever anybody gets too hung up on the divinity of Christianity, there are heretics, whenever they get too hung up on the humanity, of, I mean of Christ rather, uh, they're heretics. The earliest heresies of the church involved this issue. Uh, the, some of the earliest uh, councils of the church, Council of Nicaea, uh, were convened to address this issue. So the controversy surrounding the film is a very ancient controversy, and a controversy uh, born at the formative uh, phase of Christianity. Kazanzaki's book deals with 
that conundrum and therefore would always be controversial. Back in 1972, I, was, um, I made a film for Roger Corman, an exploitation picture, in which I learned um, how to uh, make a real movie, in a sense, so it, with a, a real budget and a real schedule. It was 24-day shooting in Arkansas, and it, had, uh, it was um, called Boxcar Bertha. And up to that point, I never really made a film on schedule, meaning that there were always student films or uh, independent films where, we, where we'd shoot we had the uh, equipment when we had the money and when the actors were available which was like every other weekend things like that so it was a very important picture for me to to study uh and to uh to get through actually just to get through it and i remember at that time literally preparing for the picture and drawing out every shot because we had a very short shooting schedule and uh about 400 500 drawings uh prim primitive drawings but basically i knew pretty much what we were going to do when i got to the set but I became very friendly with uh, Barbara Hershey and uh, David Carey, and they screened my film, Who's That Knocking, down there in Arkansas for the cast, a uh, film with Harvey Keitel and Zena Bethune. Uh, they were interested in the Catholicism in it, and she said, I have a book for you. Uh, if you ever want to make a film, I said, oh, I'd love to make a film on the Gospels or on Jesus. And when she heard that, she said, I have this book for you then. It's called Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis. And I remember an old friend of mine, John Mavros, actually, a uh, Greek, whom I met at NYU, we were at uh, film school together in the early 60s at NYU, and he always told me about this book, too. But um, she gave me the book to read. And the reason I go into detail about Boxcar Bertha was because the same techniques and the same preparation I did for Boxcar Bertha came in handy for Mean Streets, for Taxi Driver, for um, Raging Bull, uh, for After Hours, uh, for Color of Money, and particularly The Last Temptation of Christ. Every shot was drawn if not drawn, notated. Notated uh, on a separate piece of paper so that uh, literally if you had 14 drawings for the day, which meant like maybe what, 14 or 15 setups, which is very, which is moving very, very quickly, uh, and you only get 10, or you get 12, or you get three, or you get, you know, you then have those extra pieces of paper and saying you put them on another pile, so you've got to get these, and you try to figure out how you can get them in different locations, how the earth on the, right off a highway would match uh, part of the original location of Golgotha, you know, so you could uh, shoot such a close-up that nobody could tell. You can inter intercut it any way you want. Uh, in any event, um, without that experience of Oscar Bertha, there's no way I could have made this picture or any of the pictures I made, really. Uh, of course, that was not the first film I prepared that way. Uh, the short films I did at NYU were totally prepared that way because we had no money and no time and no equipment. Uh, in, in describing Kazantzakis' idea of um, Jesus being plagued by, uh, by God in a way, uh, these wings flapping, uh, this, this, in a sense, a bird of prey coming down and putting his claws in his brain, causing these headaches, this bird that uh, represents God that literally is asking of him something that's so extraordinary uh, that he can't accept it and refuses to accept it, you see it in the very first shot of the film. Uh, it's sort of the, the point of view of the bird's wings, in a sense, flying past the trees and with Jesus sleeping at the foot of the tree. And then again, you see it in, Who's you see it a number of places, but primarily you? there. And then also in the, uh, when he's walking by the lake, where he hears the footsteps behind him, and every time he turns, it isn't there. Um, these shots were designed with that in mind, so that uh, the camera's always prying and always going after him. There's, there's a paranoia almost to the camera moves, where he thinks he's being watched and being spoken about. It's true, he is. Those camels in the beginning of the scene that are uh, falling onto their knees. And uh, the minute I, I arrived on the set, I arrived on the set right at the break of dawn, my assistant director came up to me and says, they already fired one camel for having a bad attitude. That was the beginning of the day, out. The camel was gone. Another camel in who had a better attitude about things. We shot that rail quickly. Um, the walking through the uh, Magdala marketplace before going into Magdalene's house. We literally had four hours to shoot all that so that everything had to be worked out. It's very difficult to do something like that in four hours with so many people. And especially, you know, I haven't really been in any really ancient marketplaces in a long time. So, I, you know, you're not familiar. It's not familiar territory. It was really quite, quite a chore. And what you do is, you know, you design the shots. I designed the shots uh, much earlier in time, as I said, in 83 and 87. And you start you. 
figuring out which are the most important ones. And what you do is you give yourself a time limit, shot number three, which is really important, that we could do 20 minutes on. If you're going 25 minutes, you're in trouble. You either abandon it, get what you can, and move on to the next. And that's what we did in shooting big scenes like this, uh, like the marketplace, which was a big scene for this production. My name is Willem Dafoe, and I uh, played the role of Jesus in Last Temptation of Christ. There's always something wonderful about working with people from all these different backgrounds, and sometimes they don't even have a common language. You're all doing this same activity, whether it's that sitting in the room with all those men. I mean, some of those people were laborers, some of them were, I don't know, they come from so many different places. It gives a richness to the world and takes you away from yourself because you have to kind of reinvent yourself to find out where you fit in that world. When everything changes around you so radically, there's not a lot for you to hang on to. So it makes you very game for pretending and transforming and receiving. This is the scene here where he's sitting in the courtyard waiting to see the Magdalene. In the script, I put in a line of description which was straight from the book, where it describes the Magdalene as being covered by the sweat of all nations. A nice phrase. The idea of all the, um, the men waiting for Mary Magdalene and sitting around and being able to see into her area while she's making love to all these different clients, the idea was, again, the challenge of the closeness, the proximity of sin, which is around every human being every day. Um, the closeness of being thrown right up into your face. You know, this is it. Again, dealing with uh, the human side of Jesus. Uh, how does he deal with this? I say, just so that we know, <laughs> so we understand too, is if he could deal with it, we could deal with it. You see, that was the idea. As being a, I'm speaking as a Roman Catholic, and as a Roman Catholic, I took the religion very seriously and intended to be a priest when I was a kid and uh, when I was younger and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I don't know. You would ask me, uh, you know, I'm now 55 years old. I'm trying to talk about the ideas that I had when I made this film 10 years ago. And when I first read it back in 72 and 75 and finished it in 78. It was very strange for her to do this scene, certainly because in the simulated sex and the whole thing about her being a prostitute, we were dealing with these people. They, they didn't quite understand what the activity was. There was confusion about, you know, they had certain taboos against this kind of pretending and for them to go and pretend, make love with a uh, Western woman while all these other men are sitting around must have been a very strange experience. And although some of them were timid, I remember one guy in particular all of a sudden got kind of voracious and I think she felt a little ravaged by it emotionally. But of course, as you can imagine, Marty took good care of her. So. In working on this scene, I mean, it's I, I very much followed her lead. What are you doing here? I want you to forgive me. And Barbara Hershey in Mary Magdalene, as Mary Magdalene, when she gave me the book back in 1972, she said, uh, uh, when you do this film on Jesus, I, I want to be Mary Magdalene. And I smiled. I, you know, I, I, we were all about... Them. A year later, I did Mean Streets, again with the same production techniques uh, that I worked on, um, that I had employed, I should say, with um, Roger Corman. And uh, in fact, a lot of Roger Corman's crew worked on Mean Streets, and we shot most of it in Los Angeles. So by that time, our, we took different paths, Barbara Hershey and myself. I read the book. It took me a long time to read it. I wasn't a very good reader at the time. I don't mean it to, like, excuse the, the issue, but, like, I come from, you know, lower uh, class family, a lower working class, really, and there were no books in my house. So... The only literature in the house were, were my father's newspapers, the Daily News and the Daily Mirror in New York. And there were no books, and uh, there was no, reading was not encouraged. Uh, not because they didn't like it, but because they didn't understand it. It just wasn't part of the, their lifestyle. Uh, my mother and father never finished uh, grammar school. My father, at the age of nine, had to go out and work, that sort of thing. But the, um, the main uh, conduit to the outside world were visual images, uh, television images, movies on television really, and movies and movie theaters for me. So uh, the visual literacy was building up, whereas the 
verbal literacy was very difficult for me to get through. Uh, in any event, um, in the late 70s, um, Barbara Hershey met me back in LA and we had dinner a couple of times. The book never came up. And around 1981, I think it was, she did a film called The uh, Stuntman. And she received an Academy Award nomination, I think. And um, she had come through um, a period of time where she wasn't able to get jobs. And uh, she developed as an actress uh, in a very, very strong way. And I think she was extraordinary, you know, really, really remarkable. And so when I was casting in 83, I forget if she called me or if I called her or whatever, and she wanted to uh, audition. And quite honestly, I felt kind of funny about it. I said, well, you know, it's funny because she gave me the book. That's no reason why a person should have a part. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's like you get you get to the point of thinking, well, well she's that the right thing? And so why, why I'm saying this is because when she did audition, she, she uh, just uh, handled it so beautifully and she did such a great job that uh, there was no question in my mind that she should play it. Not only, did, not only that, but she also auditioned, I mean, for Bob Chartoff and Erwin Winkler, and she did just as good, just as good. And then when the film fell through, it fell through. And back in 1987, I called her up again, so let's go. And she slipped right back into the production. I did a lot of research from uh, Biblical Archaeology Review and a number of other magazines and other books and got an impression, too, of um, sometimes the assimilation of um, uh, Jews with the culture around them and that the character Mary Magdalene and a few others have tattoos, like Berber tattoos in a way, being affected by different groups of people coming into Israel and Palestine at the time and different customs coming up. It's just, just a conjecture, just an idea to show the mixture, you know. Some did, some didn't. You see, but these particular people, especially somebody like Mary Magdalene, would have, we thought, as for our character, we thought would have had aspects of assimilation with uh, other periods, other, other groups at the time, other groups coming uh, from other countries around Palestine. Whenever I see you, my heart breaks. There were certain things in the book that I felt um, were um, too convenient, plot-wise. Uh, and one of them was the fact that Mary Magdalene is um, a character who became a prostitute because Jesus, as a young man, rejected her. But that's, I think it's just a device. I don't think it's important at all. What, what's important is that uh, she's part of the overall scheme by God to create uh, Jesus as the Redeemer. She, as much as Judas, is part of the overall scheme. And if they are plagued and they're condemned because of them being sinful characters... They have to do it because of Jesus and because of the redemption and because of the sacrifice. So therefore, they're holier. Please. Stay. Is it so bad sharing a prostitute's room? I, I always remember when Marty asked me to do this, he never asked me anything about what my background was religiously or particularly how... I felt about the story. He just asked me whether I wanted to play the role. <laughs> I'm Jay Cox. I worked with Marty on many versions of The Last Temptation of Christ on the script after Paul Schrader went off to make Mishima. Welcome. Robert's Blossom. Wonderful actor Marty and I first saw in John Cassavetti's Shadows putting him in this movie I think was a kind of a link to that great unorthodox tradition of hell for leather filmmaking that we were trying to duplicate in this movie in some way. We wanted this film to have a kind of a handmade, offhand quality. Something that wasn't too finished or refined, something that was a little bit rough and rugged. And casting Robert's Blossom was a kind of secret way that we could achieve that. He closed his eyes and the camera fades out. We did those fades in the camera. In other words, they were not done optically and that sort of thing. We did it like a silent film almost. The idea of the master being alive and answering the door and then being dead was not only a kind of a prefiguration of Jesus' resurrection, but was just uh, an idea that we had. It was something we hit on in the early morning, and I think it had to do with still being in some way slightly in a sleep state. It was a slightly spacey idea that's not in the book. And it had a certain fitness about it that we didn't intellectualize. 
monasteries came into being after the time of Jesus, but there were communities of men. There were communities of men who, uh, who went out like the Essenes, uh, who supposedly had uh, put away for safekeeping the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Essenes, they had communities of men living on the outskirts of the desert. And I imagine um, that they were living in a very simple way. And so the monastery that we have here um, in the film is basically a series of small huts. And that's that's the sort of thing. They became part of the earth. They lived with the earth, you know. And um, uh, literally, that was the that was the cue we took for all of the production design. There's a scene too with um, Jesus, um, in a sense, confessing to a fellow monk, uh, in the play by Barry Miller, and um, that was a scene that was not in the original script, but it's literally from the book. And I thought it was really important to include it in the movie because, again, I was trying to make the association uh, Jesus as one of us, as a human being, and therefore would have the same fears and the same concerns as we do. In this particular case, he confesses to things that are uh, um, things he's ashamed of, which I think every one of us has in our lives, I, I think. It makes, it makes him more accessible, I think, that particular scene to an audience. Uh, an audience that's disposed to look at the film in an intelligent way, let me put it that way, an audience that does not bring preconceived ideas to the picture. If they have an open mind, he sounds like one of us. And therefore, therefore, if he could recognize these faults and these dangers in himself and then overcome them, then maybe we could, you see. That was the idea. We all sin. Not my sins. I'm a liar. A hypocrite. Just because he's dealing with these... Uh, these doubts and the, the self-loathing at times, it doesn't mean that ultimately he's not able to fulfill the role of the Redeemer. I say it's part of the process of being fully human and, and fully divine. That's the idea. That's the way Cousin Zakis looked at it. You see, it's just an interesting thought again, and it's just something that always preyed on my mind, is um, people who um, prefer the image of Jesus of being strong, uh, totally understanding exactly everything he was doing at every moment. Um, if it works for them, fine. There's a lot of people it doesn't work for. So why shouldn't this be as acceptable an image? The film could be faulted for overemphasizing the humanity of Jesus as opposed to the divinity of Christ. But, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a healthy sort of counterbalance to a lot of Christianity, which uh, tends to push aside the more uncomfortable human elements and just uh, uh, focus on the, the more glorious and uh, miracle-working uh, and redemptive spiritual elements. But uncomfortable as it is, you know, Christianity does contend and still believe that Jesus of Nazareth was both uh, fully human and fully divine, as the uh, Catechism says. I shot every day on this film, and, and I had that scene with the cobras to do. And I, I had a really high fever, and I seldom get sick, but I, I was like practically delirious. And I remember one, one funny thing was they brought the cobras, and I said, are these, well, what's the deal with them? Are they defanged, or what's the story? And they said, well, you know, uh, we, we aren't real clear about it. <laughs> And I said, well, could someone tell me that it's, just tell me that I'm going to be all right. And they more or less said, well, I, you know, we aren't quite sure about it. I, I think, yeah, it should be fine. And then when I kept on pressing them to see if it was safe, basically what they told me is they said, when a cobra stands up, you know, when in that erect pose, that, that classic cobra pose, there's, as long as you're away the amount that they are standing up, they can only strike down and then they have to recoil and then they have to get erect again before they can strike again. So as long as you're some distance away, you're pretty safe. So if you see them make a strike, just don't worry about the shot, get out of there. <laughs> I remember at the time I was smoking some time and said, Marty's an asthmatic and he can't stand cigarette smoke. Plus he didn't want anybody to get a picture of me in my Jesus costume smoking there and thought it kind of ruined the atmosphere to have Jesus sitting around with a butt hanging out of his mouth. 
And I remember it was very cold one evening, and we were in these little huts. And I was um, smoking a cigarette inside the hut. And about a half mile away, <laughs> across this huge valley, I heard this voice, it was Marty, scream, Who's smoking? <laughs> I've got orders to kill you. Go ahead. Tonight I was purified. I can't fight with God anymore. Here. Here's my neck. Cut it. I'm ready. The production values were small, in a way. When you saw the old spectaculars, then the curtains would open up and a big screen would come on, stereophonic sound would come up, and you'd have this extraordinary music, very glorious, and everybody would pretty much speak with a British accent and beautiful poetry, in a way, as much as possible, beautifully written dialogue, like in Ben-Hur, which is some excellent dialogue, or even in The Robe, the very first CinemaScope film, has that King of Kings, Nicholas Ray's film, and that sort of thing. These are pictures I always loved as a child. I always wanted to make one. But what I understood, that by the time we got to make this picture, what I understood is that if the audience heard that language and heard a British accent, they could be safe. They could turn off. They could say, it's just a biblical epic movie. Here, if they hear the language spoken by Keitel and by other people on the film, it's like somebody standing on a street corner and engaging you in this argument. The language of the time was uh, Aramaic. Now you're not going to do it in Aramaic. So where do you go to next? You know, the next language was Greek. You don't want to go to there. So the next sort of accepted language was uh, the language of King James Court, where King James brought in the best uh, writers of the era to do this definitive translation of the Bible, which is now archaic as well. You don't want characters saying these and thous because uh, that's from another time and place. So you just have to assume that people spoke in a conversational manner and in a colloquial manner. And what do we know is conversational and colloquial? Well, that's the way we sort of talk now. So if you're going to have them talk in any language, you might as well have them talk in today's language because that's as appropriate as King James's language. It's not as appropriate as Aramaic, but you're not going to get Aramaic. So uh, you just bite the bullet and do it colloquial. And then now and again, you include some odd phraseology so it doesn't get too, too streetwise, you know. Here, when Harvey and Willem are talking to each other, confronting each other, questioning each other, tearing at each other a little bit, fencing, they're doing it the way a couple of guys would who are trying to resolve... Uh, a neighborhood quarrel. They're doing it with that attitude and they're doing it with that vocabulary. It was a way of achieving a certain kind of immediacy, trying to take the mystification away from religion, make it something that could have happened on the street, which is in fact where it did happen. The fact that the streets were covered with sand is sort of irrelevant. The idea was that it should be Jesus like on 8th Avenue and 43rd Street, you see. Uh, the Jesus of the gospel was condemned by a lot of the people, a lot of the people in power because he used to hang out with prostitutes and drink at dinners. Uh, he was condemned as a, as a um, drunkard at times. It's all there in the gospel. He had no compunctions about hanging out with, the, with what was considered the low life at the time uh, because then it comes to the question of who's saved. Only those, you know who uh, go according to the laws of the church or laws of the organized religion at the time, well, no, he comes up to the point, he said, besides that, the poor and the, and the, uh, the wretched are also saved, you see, according to, of course, uh, being forgiven for their sins and that sort of thing. But the point is that he, he preferred more to, quote, quote, unquote, hang out with what we would term now the low life. And uh, they're the ones who need a lot of attention. It's, it's the idea of uh, hanging out with people on death row, you know, as, as much as the crimes of some of the people are so horrible, the real sympathy in the uh, Christianity goes not only to the people, not only concerned with the victim, but also uh, the victimizer. And this is the, the real test and the real uh, struggle in Christianity. Why? We don't have to tell you why! Not enough, we live in a whore house, but she's a Jew. She works on the Sabbath, she goes with Romans on the Sabbath. She broke Moses' law, she dies. I look so young. <laughs> It was such an adventure making this film. I haven't seen it in a long time. 
and when I see it now, the the memory of making it is very, very strong. Who has never sinned? Who? Which one of you people has never sinned? This is a version of what's one of the most beautiful thoughts and sentences in the English language. But crucially, Marty believed that the beauty of the language, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone, would give the movie a formal antique quality that would be very distancing, again, that would put brakes on what was most crucial to us, which was the immediacy and the emotion of this entire moment. He's seen you cheat your workers. He's seen you with that widow. What's her name? Judith. I was always puzzled when we finished the film and we were doing publicity. People would always look at you kind of with arched eyebrows and put an earnest look on their face and say, are you a spiritual person or are you a religious person? And in all honesty, I was always stumped by that question. <laughs> I wanted to answer them like, what well, I am, but what I am, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they don't need that information. Just watch what's up on screen and what comes across, comes across, and what doesn't, doesn't. That's always a question, you know. Does it bother you if someone's, let's say, playing a liberal politician in a movie, but in life, you know, in fact, they're a rabid conservative? You know, it's, it's better not to know those things. with uh, the style of the film taking our cue from the Italians and also from what the ancient world might have been like, particularly because they could not, they were not as mobile as we are today. If you wanted to go from one village to another, you walked or you had a donkey. I mean, I saw it there in Morocco. I saw it in Israel. And uh, if Jesus, according to Cousin Zarkas' version, was not prepared to do the Sermon on the Mount, how many people would have been there? Not very many. We always talk about biblical figures. Uh, being exaggerated, understand, uh, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that my idea was that the crowds are very small. Until they got to Jerusalem, it's a little different. There were more people in the streets than more people in the temple, that sort of thing. But on the outskirts uh, and smaller villages, the crowds must have been very small. And the word got around from what he said to people. They were able to tell other people, and the word spread that way. But if you wanted to get anywhere, it's very hard for uh, Westerners now to imagine. When you're in a place, that, you're in a part of the world like this, northern Morocco, southern Morocco, uh, you know, people don't have very much. They um, have very few cars. Uh, people walk. And so how many could have made it that day to the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the idea of, it's his first preaching here at this point in the film. He's not prepared. And the words come out, as he says, in stories, uh, meaning parables. But we didn't want to use the word parable because, again, that's a word that's used in the biblical epics. And we wanted people to understand it's a story, you see. In any event, um, uh, the smaller crowds make it more realistic. And I tell you, this goes back to Howard Hawks's Land of the Pharaohs. And as a child, I, I noticed there was not a cast of ten th tens of thousands the way, were, the way they were in Quo Vadis. I was the first time I began to say, well, maybe the ancient world really looked like this in a way that the world was less populated too at the time. And to scale down made it more realistic, I thought. What's the seed? love my sense of it is really is it so radically different the basic parables the basic ideas are the same it's just to find a way to try to get to the sense of it and the idea that cousins has explored so deeply about the duality of the jesus figure that we tend to cheat and we make him only divine and then that makes us unable to uh, identify with him. Jesus is divine from the get-go in all the other movies. This, this guy is more man than divine all through this. That's what the story is. And I don't know how you play divine anyway, except for backlight you and wash your hair every day and uh, have a celestial uh, you know, chorus on the uh, soundtrack. Whoever's hungry for justice, they're the ones who will be blessed. They'll be filled with bread. They'll never be hungry again. They'll have the real value, the value of love. 
to love, share, and comfort. They'll have the courage to do the good. And you, your mourning. The mourners will be blessed. There's a little bit of the revival preacher here in the way Willie's doing this. Which I thought was brilliant. And of course, these, peop these people are... They're a little skeptical. And they're very hungry. They're poor people. And believe me. But the character of Jesus now is overcome because he's put aside his pain and he's achieved, at least for a while, a certain amount of certainty. And it's his certainty that begins to communicate to these people as much as what he's saying. see them all running away. I remember in the middle of the scene, they had a lot of the extras had to break for prayers several times. Because, <laughs> of course, uh, Morocco is a Muslim country. And some of the more uh, devout uh, Muslim brothers would have to break three times during the workday to, uh, for prayers. <laughs> kind of put a crimp in the uh, filming day sometimes. Oh, no, no, not the two of you. His own intensity has carried the crowd off in a direction that, of course, he never, he, he never intended. Since he is not fully human, he does not fully understand human beings. But he wants nothing more than that understanding and that love. He wants that humanity. And, of course, that's what scandalized people so deeply about the movie. The fact that Jesus, who could have and do anything, wanted the one thing in the world that everyone takes for granted. Simple humanity, love, family. The most blessed things there are. When I first heard Marty was going to do Last Temptation, I thought, what a strange thing. I thought, well, everybody has their, <laughs> their weird pet projects, you know. But I really didn't know why I wanted to do it. And the first time I heard they were casting, no one was interested in me. And I didn't even pursue it. I just heard about it. It was something that was like happening. It occasionally happens, you know, a project that you hear about, but you don't think you're right for it, you know the Bible, me, it just seemed strange, you know. So I didn't even think about it, and they weren't talking to me either. And then I heard it came up again, and they were testing all kinds of people, particularly for Jesus, I think. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to it then. But then, when he showed me the script, and when he talked to me, I had this weird sense of, of course, I'm the only guy to do this. That sounds horribly... Um, Maybe the word's arrogant, I don't know. Or just deluded. But I just, the way he described what he wanted to do, I think maybe that's why I didn't worry about it. We had other casting suggestions involved for the role of Jesus back in 1983. At different points, we considered Christopher Walken, Eric Roberts, and of course, Aidan Quinn. But in the summer of 1987, I became very much aware of Willem Dafoe and Platoon. His performance was uh, really extraordinary, I thought. He had a physical quality that was really very strong and a quality that embodied spirituality that was quite interesting to me. I thought it would be a very good idea to see if we could get him to do this picture. And we talked about it, and he was certainly willing to try it. The rest of the cast had been cast already in 1983 from the very um, exhaustive first round of casting that we did then. I remember simply getting a call from my agent that Marty Scorsese wanted to see me. He sent me the script. I liked it very much. I went in to meet Marty. We discussed it a little bit. He asked me if I wanted to play the role of Jesus. It was very direct and very simple. And when I think back on it, the most amazing thing to me is that I had no reservations about it. The way Marty talked about the film, he was so clear and so passionate about it that um, I just very much wanted to be a part of helping him do this film. 
And it never even occurred to me whether I was right for the film or... It's funny, it was, uh, it was a leap of faith. The foundation is the soul. The foundation is the body! That's where you must begin. No, if you don't change the spirit first, change what's inside, then you're only going to replace the Romans with somebody else, and nothing ever changes. Even there were different styles, of course, in the picture and the acting. I mean, uh, Willem approaches things uh, oriented towards a goal in the scene. Harvey likes to uh, kaitel, and Harvey and I started together, you know, so it was like we're old friends, and we sort of like to explore it a little bit. And so um, you find interesting uh, moments between the two. And it was perfect, I think, for Judas to be the one to try to explore and try to understand all this. And Jesus finally to be uh, the one to tell him, this is the plan. It's finally been revealed to me. A little bit at a time, it's been revealed to me. And now I could tell you, uh, and this happens a lot in movies where you get an actor going one way, working one way, and another actor working, you know, they use the word method. But um, I, I think Harvey is very much, very much in line with the uh, Lee Strasberg method, there's no doubt. Uh, but um, we used to like to talk that way, Harvey and I. In all the rehearsals, we would talk. And for months before, in all of 1983, he came and auditioned the other Jesuses for me. So he played Judas to their Jesus. And Harvey and I would just talk and talk and talk, 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 talk about the project, about the scenes, about Judas, about what it must have been like, about these concepts, about, about hearing the plan for the first time and realizing what's going on and having a real human reaction uh, against it and that sort of thing. So that's, that's the way I was used to working. You know, uh, Barbara Hershey works another way. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton another way totally different so again everybody had to be kind of corralled into shape to do these scenes all within 55 days shooting i don't know whether harvey has a different approach than i do it's hard to say because i'd have to pretend i know what his process is and i really don't i think you reinvent your process for each role harvey to me is a very very natural actor everything comes to him very fast and very easily he's got real authority but I think he likes a lot of preparation. Sometimes in watching him, I, it, it was always a curious thing because he never seemed to really need it. We had no crane. We had a little jib arm, a panther, it was called. And basically, I'd imagine lots of shots with cranes uh, pulling up into the sky and that sort of thing. But we can only go maybe four or five feet, seven feet up. That was about it. And you'll see it in the scene at the um, Olive Grove with Jesus and Judas sleeping. But the budget and the constraints made it really possible for us to deal with people who have God around them all the time. And the natural and the supernatural are coexisting. It's part of everyday life. And that also helped us in uh, showing the quote miracles, unquote, or the supernatural aspects of the story. Uh, they were totally real. When Jesus takes the seed of the apple and throws it, you cut and the tree is already there. It doesn't grow out of the earth and stop action, stop motion photography. It isn't computer generated, it's there, because it is there for him. And uh, I think, you know, to a certain extent, people who um, live with that in their hearts and their minds every day, they'll see it. They'll see it and be believable to them. When you get to Andre Gregory playing John the Baptist, his presentation, his, his show was like, he was a voice crying in the wilderness and he put on quite a show, I'm sure in a good sense. He, uh, I guess what, like uh, a medicine show, a tent show, a revivalist meeting in the South, in America. And that idea, he would preach in such a strong way. And he, he, he looked a certain way too. He looked like a wild man, you see, uh, as opposed to other people, so that he would get a lot of attention. And uh, then he would give his message, you see. He had to create something that got attention. And I think when he got that attention, okay, so that meant that the scene had to be like a, a wild revivalist meeting in a way, which is another style of worship totally, but this is what made him so important, I think. And when he did create that attention, I don't think it was only Jews of the, of the time who were there. I think there were others. I think there were uh, people from other states around them, other countries around them, uh, Egyptians, Canaanites, as I, as I say again, people from Sudan, uh, all over who came to see this man. I think he preached to all, all of them, and if he didn't, others would come and watch anyway, you see. I think because it was such an event whenever he preached, and he had such a following, I think, around him. And uh, that's how we approached the um, John the Baptist sequences, even to a certain extent, some nudity in them, and people taking what he's saying the wrong way, almost falling into a kind of religious ecstasy, which is close to sexuality, the danger of uh, enjoying the punishment. 
I see the, 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 the self-flagellation, all of that sort of thing, where we see today on CNN, you know, you looked at Good Friday yesterday and they showed uh, footage of uh, men in um, the Philippines being crucified to crosses for Good Friday. As they pointed out, the Roman Catholic Church frowns on that. They use the word frowns. Uh, I, would, I should say so. You know, but this is the way they worship. One can't say, <laughs> you know, you can't do that. Uh, that's what they do. But I think part of religious fervor, you know, there's a t tendency, obviously, uh, in which the sexuality is dangerously close to the ecstasy, a religious ecstasy. He says, prepare the way of the Lord. This scene was difficult, as I remember, because they were worried about scandalizing the Moroccan authorities, but I think we were far enough in the desert away from the Moroccan authorities so that there would not be any substantial concern. Marty was kind of a historical religious instructor for me and told me that he believed that this is the way people were baptized at this time. I said I thought that would be great to show, but... He was already well on his way to doing that anyhow. My baptism with Andre. This is the old order meets the new. Again, Marty always encouraged me to think about it in the most simple confrontational terms. So John will test him and know him and reconfirm Jesus' own sense of himself and his and the weight of his destiny. I, from my long years in journalism, have a journalist's inclination toward immediacy. I did enough historical research on my own to become oriented. But I knew that even if I had spent a year doing nothing but reading and learning, I could never know as much or feel as much as Marnie did. I mean, this is in many ways his most personal and naked movie. Nothing is of value. The tree is rotten. You have to take the axe and cut it down. I uh, grew up trying to place in proper balance uh, the Christian teaching and the law of the street. I think it's very hard to do, <laughs> to say the least. And um, I saw both exist together, coexist in the streets. And it's something that I'll just never get past. I mean, it's just something that's the way I was, that's what I come from and that's who I am. And that's what interests me. I have said recently a number of times to friends of mine who were talking, I said, you know, I w I've always wanted to do films of the spirit, spiritual film, but religion gets in the way. What I mean by that is that in this particular film, by directing his picture, dealing with the iconography head on and dealing with the themes head on may not have been as successful as dealing with those themes in Mean Streets and Raging Bull where time places it in a different context. But it's still the same theme, you see. And um, if the films are successful at all, I don't know. I ultimately don't know. Quite honestly, don't know. I mean, it's different thinking that a film is successful because you've succeeded in getting on screen what you wanted to get on, but does it communicate? It doesn't mean anything to anybody. I'm not sure. You know, I only know now that you never know. And that's, that's the reality of it. You just keep doing them. But dealing with this imagery head on and dealing with these themes head on directly in the context of the story of the time, of 2,000 years ago may have been more difficult and may not have been entirely successful as I wanted it to be because uh, I'm not too satisfied with it. It's probably more fitting for me to be dealing with these themes on an everyday scale, the way I did in Mean Streets or Raging Bull or uh, even the King of Comedy, a little bit in Color of Money, not much. Oh, and Goodfellas too, which is totally the negation of all this. This is the first thing we shot. I remember they said, there's lots of scorpions in this area. When you kick over a rock, look extra carefully <laughs> because scorpions like to hide under them in the hot sun. Well, I just walked through a whole <laughs> quarter of a mile of rocks. Marty was very funny. This is one thing I remember, and I th I'm sure he'd cop to it, but he loves movies, clearly, but he's not a uh, outdoorsman. <laughs> He loves shooting, but I don't think he likes all the, the nature around in this particular case. But I do. That's one of my favorite things about it. This is a beautiful low-tech solution to Jesus making on almost perfect circle. They put some white dust under the brown rocks. So 
inch by inch, as long as I was on white, I knew I was on the right path. And if I got off of it, I'd correct to get back on the white dust underneath the uh, rocks. One of the things that's gone unremarked about Last Temptation is that it marks Marty's first foray into extensive use of exterior locations and geography to represent a sort of spiritual state. Much of the intensity of these scenes of Jesus in the desert derives from Marty's exhilaration in the use of locations, in effect, of busting out of the old neighborhood, getting out in the country. It was miserable shooting this because it was very, very, very lonely, and it was very, very cold, and I'm wearing very little here. And also, I was doing all this stuff with these effects, and some of it was voiceover, and some of it was interacting with effects that weren't there. I feel sorry for you. The serpent speaking in Mary's voice. Tough scene. Um, we didn't want it to look like Cult of the Cobra, talking snakes, very tough. So we decided, or Marty decided, and then kind of sounded me out about it, how it would work, just to do it in the most simple way, which is to say, shot of snake, Barbara's voice, and that's what he did. It was a real kind of watchword for his approach to the entire movie, which is the simplest, most direct way is usually the most heartfelt way, the way in which technology can interfere the least and get in the way of the emotion. What arrogance to think you can save the world. The world doesn't have to be saved. Save yourself. Find love. You have Barbara's voiceover, which perhaps they recorded and played on the spot. But it's to be coming out of a cobra. Uh, there's a real low-budget aesthetic there. And I think that was important, that it, that it made it small. You couldn't be overwhelmed with them, but at the same time, you got the idea. Oh. Jesus. The snake that blows up is cut to a fake snake in one frame and it explodes. It's a straight cut. The voices of the animals that speak to him are literally just simple voiceovers that we treated. Barbara Hershey's voice treated a certain way. Keitel's voice as Judas treated a certain way. The approach had to be simplicity, I hoped. And I hope we achieved it, I don't know. After 10 days, a hunger went away. It's very important to point out the utter simplicity of these scenes. This is not a great audio animatronic figure. It's not a Muppet. It's not a CGI effect. It's just an animal in a close shot with a voice laid over. We're both bigger than that. Who are you? Well, it's lacking usually in the uh, biblical epics. Again, I must say, a movies that are, I'm very fond of. I did my own little drawings of uh, when I was a kid about stories of ancient Rome. I just fascinated by the ancient world and uh, those biblical epics. But one of the other things that was missing from those biblical epics was humor. And I think, you know, humor is a very important thing. I think mean, we had we had a good time. Why shouldn't there be humor in it? And particularly also in the scene where uh, Jesus is in the desert at night and he undergoes the temptations and a lion walks up to him and talks to him. And we always felt uh, that, uh, you know, you're in the desert 40 days, 40 nights without eating. You know, something goes by, it's going to talk to you. And you say, so take that for what it is, and you have Keitel's voice coming out of the, uh, the line saying, hello, Jesus, whatever. And it's, uh, it is a kind of teasing of Jesus, too, because he's teasing him with power. So why not be friendly? And you say, we're talking about hallucination to a certain extent there, in that particular part of the film. And then there's lots of it where we tried to do, because humor is part of you being human, you know? I mean, we tried not to force it, but whenever it came up, we tried to go with it particularly with the scenes with the apostles. Uh, uh, Archangel, move back. Move back, you blind. The image of Satan tempting him. Um, we had to get something elemental because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't think what it could be. At first I thought a light, and I said a light, a beam of light. And I said, we've seen that so many times. I said, that usually implies something else too. It implies paradise, implies seeing the light, and going to the light, the idea of redemption. 
and uh, fulfillment, a saving of a soul. But the devil, something else, and it had to be something elemental, you know. So I thought of fire, a column of fire that just came up. And I put my voice in there with Leo Marx. Leo Marx is the writer of Michael Powell's uh, film, powerful movie that he made in the early 60s, which ended his career called Peeping Tom. And Leo was a uh, decoder during the war in England. Uh, I was working on those, I guess, Enigma and all those projects and that sort of thing. I don't, he's written several books on it and that sort of thing. And he had an extraordinary voice and um, we blended our voices together. He was here in New York and we had him come to the Brill Building and do it. But uh, basically when you see it, when you hear the voice, you, you see the voice emanating from uh, a tower of, of flame. And that was simply a little gas jet that we put in the middle of the desert. You know, at first we thought maybe the whole circle around Jesus should go into flames. I thought that was getting too tricky. It should be as simple as possible. We couldn't have afforded the technology, and I'm glad of it, because the technology would have gotten in the way of the intentional and, I think, very winning roughness of the film. We'll see each other again. The more effects you do, the more scope it's given, the more it starts to look like King of Kings, and that gets it further away from the territory where it should stand and live. Don't be afraid. There's something wonderful about being in every scene of the movie because not only, somewhere you can deeply relax. I mean, uh, you don't worry about the effect of every scene because there's so many scenes that you feel like they'll find a natural rhythm and a natural order. You can let your ego go a little bit because you know you're going to be all through the film and whatever's going to surface is going to surface. And I've always thought that's what character is anyway. It's people being revealed through through action. This reminds me of the shot at the end of The Searchers and the same shot at the beginning of The Searchers. And Willem walking to this house always reminded me of someone who just survived an Indian attack somehow. We were a couple of city boys, Marty and me, and of course anytime we get out in the desert we immediately think of cowboys and Indians. Being in the desert for a long time, the makeup man wanted to have, have my eyes have a crazy look, so he took uh, ophthalmologist drops and put them in my eyes. And he thought just somewhere the audience would register the kinkiness of these dilated eyes in this bright, bright sunlight. Well, he overdid it, and uh, I couldn't see for like three days. <laughs> I couldn't see, and I said to the guy, oh, I'm a little worried about this. He said, okay, I overdid it a little bit, but uh, in the morning, you'll, you'll be fine. And I remember waking up in the morning and looking at my alarm clock and not being able to read it at all, and I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble. Go ahead. No. I've talked too much already, silent. It was nice that we shot very much in sequence, as much as possible. It was a dream for me as an actor uh, just to follow kind of a, <laughs> a straight line and have the story work on me. Preparing for the role, it was a question of scrubbing myself of any expectations or any images, which I suppose is a good process for any time you start working on a role. But most often you like to attach yourself to some sort of task or some sort of image, and then that helps to give you the authority in the pretending. And then you proceed just through action and doing the story. But this was unique in that regardless of how you're brought up, you have so many images of Jesus and of certain aspects of this story. So it was very important to kind of cleanse yourself of those things and to allow yourself to rethink it. And as an actor, it was sweet because the story is very much about forces outside of this man working on him. And that's the way I felt as an actor. I just tried to place myself in the story and become a vehicle for things to work on me to help tell the story. Now they say they're going to kill everyone who was baptized. No one forced you to be baptized. You were baptized too. You begged for it, so be quiet. Here are these guys always arguing with each other. Bunch of pains. 
Now, they happen to be sitting in the desert, but uh, give them some espresso cups and a little table, and they could be sitting around a social club somewhere. Same kind of petty jealousy, same sort of arguments. They're all trying to lay some kind of claim to him. They all want something from him. They all want to be his favorite. Plus, they keep bringing all the glorious things Jesus is saying down to a very mundane level, which is, after all, the basic level on which any philosophy has to live it's, if it's going to flourish and endure. Otherwise, it becomes rarefied. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, leave the desert. I am finished and return to mankind. How do we know the Baptist really said that? Everybody says he did. But how do we know? Well, even if he didn't, the words are still important. Why? Because people believe them. And what one of the worst reviews came out of the picture. We had so many bad reviews. But one of the worst ones came out of a, one of those tabloids in England. I forget which one. And this writer, this reviewer, was just scathing. However, near the end of it, he says, but what's all this talk about everybody complaining about the, the accents and the dialogue? He said, where does it say that uh, everybody in ancient Judea learned how to speak by listening to the BBC? And I said, well, uh, totally understandable. I said, you know, it's a conceit of style, which is no longer relevant. Uh, if you're making a story this way, it's no longer relevant. It doesn't engage the audience anymore. I love those pictures, but our picture was going to be one which we engage the audience just like the guy sitting next to you in a theater turn to you and argue of these points that are going on in the film and challenge you, challenge you to think about what love and compassion really is. That's the idea. You know, that's one of the key reasons we cast Harvey and a lot of the other people in the film. And by the way, not every one of these apostles came from the same part of Israel. Apparently, uh, the Galileans had a, such a strong accent. And uh, I read this in a book called Jesus the Jew. I think it was by, I forget the man's name, the writer. But it has such a strong accent that uh, they would very often, when they came to Jerusalem, would be made fun of with their accent. They would be questioned about their accent. For example, if they were asking a marketplace for a melon, a man selling a melon said, you, could, you either ask for a donkey or a melon. Which one, which one is it? Because the accent was so strong. You understand? So that um, Galilean accent may have been as strong for all we know, may have had the same effect as we hear an American Southern accent or Sicilian accent in Italy right now the past few hundred years. So in any way, we felt free to play around with accents in the film on a historical basis because of that, and also because of the, uh, the more important reason of really engaging the audience and making, and making them see, you're not going to get away with this, it's not entertainment. Let's really get into this picture and have some fun. I think the thinking was that these were, these were working class people. They spoke quite simply. They had minimal education. They were, they were workers. So they didn't speak poetically <laughs> and we had to find the language that was uh, simple I'm not inviting you to a celebration I'm inviting you to a war now this wasn't in the book but I put it in there because I wanted to show that these people lived in a world where the miraculous could be part of day-to-day -day life and that a man could actually reach into his chest and pull out his heart, display it, and put it back into his chest. And that um, people would accept it as, as a miracle, but miracles were part of life. It was only after the film that uh, someone pointed out to me that the emblem of my college, Calvin College, was the symbol of a heart held in a hand. In the scene where Jesus uh, puts his hand into his chest and takes his heart out, this is something that we were trying for, that the apostles needed a sign. And at that moment, that's what they saw. As I said, the supernatural exists, coexists with the natural. A powerful speaker, a powerful personality that Jesus became, especially at that point in the story, he's able to make them see that heart come out. That was the idea. Now, you can interpret it as a mass hallucination any way you want, but they saw the heart come out. Who's to say it didn't? Now, go back even further, that's not in the book, that's an invention by Paul Schrader in the original script, you know, because he felt that they needed something as strong, a dramatic image that would make the apostles a cohesive group. Today and tomorrow I cast out devils and work cures. On the third day, I shall be perfected. I was stunned when Marty first told me his idea for this scene. He got this somewhere, I think, on one of his, some of his archaeological readings or 
occasional wanderings. And this, of course, very much inspired by faith healers, the ancient tradition and the modern application of faith healing both. Willem is not only dazzled physically and drained, but he's stunned by what he is able to do here. These scenes were elided from the book there and from the Bible. There are many scenes of Jesus' miracles and curing. And we transposed several in sequence and put them where we thought they would be the most effective dramatically. To give you an idea of the pace, I remember we had to rush very quick to uh, do this healing of the blind man. And it was like a, a bad joke because we were, I had it like another location and everybody was yelling, come on, come on, we got to run down. We got to run down to heal the blind man. The element of magic and superstition, mystery and miracles being part and parcel of the time, being in the texture of the fabric of the age. And uh, as something that has gotten lost in uh, 2,000 years of Christianity was uh, essentially this um, supernatural kind of uh, sense in this world uh, where you know a lot of uh, Christ's miracles had in them the paraphernalia of the time of magic healing. You know, whether it is putting uh, caked mud on the eyes or anything like that, that was something that was done. And in fact, uh, Jesus of Nazareth was not the only one out there doing it. And it's mentioned in the Bible, you know, the fact that, you know, why is he different than the other ones? Uh, there were a fair number of these itinerant preachers, you know, that uh, descendants of the prophetic tradition who would go around and uh, preach the end of the world or preach uh, revolution and uh, employ magical tricks and, and so forth. So I think it was important to emphasize that Jesus existed in the texture of these times and that uh, he wasn't the first to be doing this stuff and it wasn't so shocking to people when he did it. It was important to realize that this was a time and place where the supernatural was not considered that far outside of everyday experience and that uh, there were healings and there were signs and divinations. What do you think heaven's like? It's like a wedding. God's the bridegroom and man's spirit's the bride. The wedding takes place in heaven and everyone's invited. God's world is big enough for everybody. Nazarene, that's against the law. Then the law is against my heart. All right. See? It's a revolutionary. <laughs> people talk about a Jesus curse, you know. All the people that have ever played Jesus, their careers have never uh, survived that choice. It's basically an old-fashioned kind of superstition. But I, I don't think it's necessarily true. And who knows what this movie did for my career. I mean, in some ways, very good things, and in some ways, maybe, I don't know, maybe not so good things. But I don't care. It was a wonderful experience, and I think it's a great movie, so. I remember meeting uh, Max von Sydow once. Sweetness comes off this guy, he's very dignified. He came over to me at, on the set of Wild at Heart and said, Congratulations, we are both members of a very exclusive club. <laughs> because he played uh, Jesus in what? Great story ever told or something? I get the epics mixed up. But, but people point to um, Jeffrey Hunter and also to the, in the old uh, King of Kings, the guy that played Jesus in that, I guess never quite recovered. Now people talk about the Superman curse now.
There's a number of books written about the humor of Jesus. Uh, in this particular film, he laughs, he dances. It's, uh, he dances at the uh, wedding of Cana, again taking the cue from uh, his criticism in the Gospels by the organized religion at the time as being a drunkard and being a person who hung out with prostitutes and, and that sort of thing. So that uh, there is an enjoyment of life also. And that's one of the reasons why The Last Temptation is so powerful for him, because of the enjoyment of life. I think the limitations on budget and time may have worked well for the film because uh, it kept a certain kind of scale and kept us rooted. Didn't allow us to wallow in it or take too long or think too much about it. Of course, Marty had thought about this project for years and was very clear about what he wanted to do. But for the rest of us, it was just something immediate and direct. You know, it took away from a, a kind of uh, preciousness or self-consciousness. For me, I can only speak for myself, uh, it was just very direct, very hands-on. It wasn't a traditional film in the f respect that we didn't have trailers. We had very long hours. Sometimes we'd have to hike considerable ways to make it to a location. You know, and we were like an army. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of comfort and the hours were very long. But without getting too misty about it, we, I didn't think about it that much. Everybody was so engaged and uh, so happy to be there. And we had really left Hollywood and kind of traditional filmmaking behind on this one, I'd say. Uh, it was just difficult to the degree that sometimes it was frustrating that we have to fight very hard to get what we wanted to do. And I hold the keys and I open the door and I decide who goes in and who doesn't. You're my brothers from Nazareth, and you're the first I invite on the ark. When he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, this preaching, I was very disappointed about not being able to get, well, stunt men and people who really could have given me some action when the riot breaks out. We had great difficulty doing that. We also would have liked a different look for Nazareth, still the same little village of Umnast, the one he leaves in the beginning of the movie. <laughs> So it's that kind of thing where, where I really felt the restrictions. But as Ballhouse said, and as all of us understood too, and as I understood too from having the plug pulled on me in 1983, it made me understand that there really wasn't that much of a place for me in Hollywood anymore. And I had to figure out how to make pictures cheaper and faster. And it was also a lesson, maybe, as I said, of arrogance, maybe. And I had to learn the hard way, and we had to make it the hard way. And the beauty of it is that I'd probably never be satisfied with it. And that's what it is. Umnast played for Mary Magdalene's Magdala, played for Nazareth, and Capharnaum, I think, another, another place, if I'm not mistaken, in the film. But we used that village, and there were no television aerials, it was nothing. 20 minutes outside, or 10 minutes outside of Marrakesh, people are still walking with donkeys, and it looks like something three, 4,000 years old. And so we kept it at that scale, a human scale, a scale of the everyday man, you know. Jesus was poor. We didn't want to have the Jesus of the old of the old epic films who came in in a beautiful, immaculate white robe and when he walked in a room, everybody turned their heads because his head was glowing. You see, the idea of this Jesus was a guy you would meet on the street, on a road. He'd be first a human being. And then when you hear what he had to say and how he lived uh, by giving his example, that's something different, you see. So that led to the way the film looks, which was, as I say, utilizing what's there because it hasn't changed in four or five thousand years. It just hasn't changed. I have a father in heaven. This is my wife, Verna. You can see the resemblance in the reverse here between her and Barbara. This is a very hard scene for my wife, emotionally, be rejected by her son. And although you can't see it, below camera, left, Harvey is holding her hand because she was trembling. Didn't you see them? <gasps> what? When he spoke to you, there were thousands of blue wings behind him. I swear to you, Mary, there were armies of angels. <gasps> of course, she can't see them. She only sees the flesh of her flesh, the most human of mothers. And the Lazarus scene, as I did throughout the picture, try to deal with the anthropology of the time or create a new world in a way.
create aspects of anthropology of North Africa today and the Middle East today mixed with the ancient world from what we know. One of the key things there is the are the professional mourners. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a tradition in many cultures over the years. That was that was the concept. Doesn't mean that there aren't people who didn't know Lazarus, you know, uh, but um, the wailing outside the tomb is very important. You see, as part of the uh, mourning process. Marty's nightmare for this scene was that it should, in some way, look like something out of a Hammer film. Now we love Hammer films, but somehow that didn't seem quite appropriate for this moment. And we searched around for what would be the most human and everyday reality of a scene like this, and we realized the smell. And so you see everyone covering their mouths for the smell. There's a very kind of a candy box Jesus that has been a popular figure over the years, 100 years, 150 years, that is very sweet and is very beautiful. But that's not necessarily how he looked, for all we know. And it gives comfort to a lot of people, so I'm not condemning it in any way. I'm not even looking down at it or even criticizing it. But it's a certain way, it's a certain style looking at Jesus. And interestingly enough, what Schrader thought, and I think Schrader was right, and that's why one of the reasons Willem was cast, is that this Jesus in this film, based on Cousin Zaka's novel, is so different from the other Jesus that you normally see in movies I that um, to make it a little more shocking so people would open their ears and open their eyes and listen and, and see it uh, with the new way of uh, looking and listening was to make it look like the Jesus that you normally see with the blonde hair, blue eyes and the small beard. That's a comfortable Jesus that we all kind of know and that's a, a Jesus that uh, is, is white in a way to engage the audience and take them off guard and saying, this, oh, you, you see this image of this person? Oh, you think you know that? Well, this is going to be different. You say, this is going to be different. Um, with the scene with Lazarus, for example, I remember working on it and being interested in how Jesus would perceive this, the raising of Lazarus. He's not aware of how much power he has until he does that. And then where does his power come from? Sure enough, he knows it comes from God. And he knows he's meant for something special. And don't forget, throughout the whole first half of the picture up to that point, he's fighting to stay away from whatever this is special from God. He doesn't want to do it. That's according, to, again, to the character created by Gazanzakis in the book. When he reaches in to take Lazarus's hand, Lazarus almost pulls him into the underground with him. And you see in his face the fear of facing death and the fear of his own power. Because if he has this much power, there's gonna be a lot asked from him. And he's been avoiding it throughout the whole half of the story, the first half of the story. He knows whatever's, uh, whatever's gonna be asked of him is gonna to, going to entail this. It's gonna be a knowing death. In other words, you read Dostoevsky and you read about capital punishment of being the most cruel thing. Because in capital punishment, you know you're going to die at a specific time. In a battle, you may have a chance. There's always that hope. You see, but uh, when you're going to be condemned, you're going at a certain morning and they're going to take you and they're going to put you in a chair. They're going to, they're going to hang you or they're going to crucify you. You know, it's, there's no way out. You see, and that's what I think he feels there at that point. And this is an ordinary man that's given this extraordinary responsibility and he resists it and struggles with it. Actors always look for fantasies, right? That are near and dear to their heart. And that's, that's certainly a strong fantasy for me. We wound up shooting the second half of the film in a city in Morocco called Meknes. And that had a little more of an urban look to it, in a way. It had walls, but the walls came from five, six hundred, seven hundred years ago. The leader of that particular part of the world, in that particular city, had built those walls. And he also had stables. And the stables was a series, it was a series of walls with arches and had a ceiling to them. But now the ceiling was gone, and it was just the arches were out in the open. With no ceiling, it was even better because we wouldn't have to light it then. You see, well, very little lighting was needed. And we put some straw mats on the ceiling to create a ceiling. And that was the idea of also uh, keeping on the production value. And oddly enough, Boris Levin and I talked about Jesus entering the temple. Back in 1983, we went to Jerusalem and we went below the, the uh, Mosque of the Dome. 
and below that is a place called Solomon's Stables. They really were in his stables, but they are a series of arches, and it was like an underground city. We wanted people, we wanted Jesus to be coming through that, where people living under there, you know, um, before going up into the temple, because even then we couldn't afford something to look like the temple, the way they have in King of Kings and other films. In this scene, when I'm going to break up the temple, we just wanted it to be kind of violent, and we figured out a rough path for where I was going to go, what I was going to throw, what I was going to knock over. But it wasn't exactly precise. They just wanted me to tear through this thing like a bull in a china shop. And it made me a little nervous when we kind of marked it out. And I said, I'm happy to do it, but I feel a little uncomfortable. I'm worried someone's going to get hurt because I was throwing metal things and stuff was going flying. And people said, no, no, that's nice of you to worry, but it's really no problem. We'll just be careful. And uh, I said, okay, okay, don't say I didn't warn you. And on the very next take, at the end of the take, I looked over and Michael Ballhaus was slumped over the camera with blood streaming from his head. And one of these gold plates that I threw went flying through the air like a frisbee and knocked him in the head, gave him several stitches. This is uh, a frequently excerpted scene from the film. Since they don't like to excerpt the putatively scandalous moments from the film, this simple, strong, and magnificent moment with the money changes in the temple, the physicality of this scene was always very key to me because Jesus was a physical man, a carpenter after all. And his rage here, his wonderful righteous rage, is the bedrock of this presentation of his character for me because it's his humanity with roman coins they have images of false gods on them you want pagan gods in the temple All the high priests are very logical here my secret approach to the scene was always like a bunch of righteous young filmmakers arguing with the studio executives studio executives are always almost seductively reasonable and what you need here is your sense of self, your anger, and your sense of purpose. This is a generational conflict. It's a philosophical conflict, a theological conflict. The Jewish clique that ruled uh, under the Romans uh, made their money on the exchanging of uh, currency at the temples. So that when, uh, you know, Jesus overturns the money changers, he's, he's threatening uh, not so much the Roman, but the uh, Judaic power structure. The issue of whether uh, in the book uh, other antagonists to uh, Jesus were more fleshed out, uh, the priestly clique, uh, the Sanhedrin, which uh, ran Jerusalem underneath uh, the Romans, uh, I sort of downplay that because uh, uh, neither the Romans nor the Jews were the real antagonists here, nor was Judas. You know, the antagonist is uh, God himself who is in fact inside Jesus or part of Jesus or Jesus himself. And, uh, and you know, so for the same reason that uh, Cousin Zacchaeus didn't make Judas an antagonist, you didn't make... Um, uh, the Sanhedrin or the Romans antagonist. You know, what you have to remember that this is a quintessentially ex existentialist book, you know, written in an existentialist century. And it represents this century as much as it does the first century. I didn't read the novel, uh, the Cuts and Sackis novel, because I didn't feel the need to. The script was enough for me. And I, I, for some reason, I, I didn't want any more info. I didn't want to have an allegiance to the book and feel that uh, we were interpreting the book. I left that up to Marty. I really wanted to have as much beginner's mind as possible on this thing. Uh, this guy playing Lazarus, I knew from uh, touring in Italy with the Woost Group. He's an American that was living there for several years, and he had his own theater company there, so it's kind of wild to see him. 
Well, they're going to kill Lazarus because he is the living evidence of Jesus's power. And here again, we have the sort of offhand, everyday conversational dialogue that some people needle this for, but in fact, I think works perfectly. What was it like? Which is better, death or life? What are you going to ask a guy who'd been dead? What was it like to be dead? These lines came from Marty's explaining the subtext of the scene to me emotionally by paraphrasing the emotion, expressing it in his own words. And I loved the humanity and the immediacy of the way he put it. And I said, well, I think we should use that. And so that's what we did. I think that the approach to the dialogue sometimes shocked people almost as much as the sensuality of the last portion of the movie. Our influence there was, of course, the gospel according to St. Matthew. And also on the waterfront, these guys were fishermen. We wanted them to sound like longshoremen. I'm not surprised. How could they let Lazarus live? He was proof of your greatest miracle. Now he's I don't separate the, well, the kind of performing you do in theater from the kind of performing you do in film. When I work on a theater piece, I work with this company, the Wooster Group, and it's not a conventional theater. We don't just take a play and stage it. It's a theater company that makes their own theater pieces, so the process is very long. And if anything, it reminds me of how we work on movies. And there's a real cut-and-paste uh, feeling to the creation of these pieces. Also, since the work is tailor-made for our needs and our desires and our interests, we tend to work a lot from ourselves. And I think that gives me a deeper sense of that in film. I mean, I'm interested in self-revelatory uh, moments in the theater. That's what's exciting. And I guess that could apply to work on Last Temptation. I mean, I as much wanted to use this as a spiritual exercise for myself, truly. This is Marty, right here. What a performance. <laughs> he's smart, though. If he's going to do something, he gets a fabulous costume. <laughs> he was wounded for our transgressions, yet he opened not his mouth. Basically, I think this movie had a huge impact on me in the respect that it did start to make me make a connection between the work I do and um, some sort of, you know, a spiritual need, which I've always felt, but I think this helped to articulate it more deeply. I mean, performing can be a very high art. It can be a very low art. I don't think it has to be one or the other. It's always a combination of the two. You mean you're not the Messiah? I am. That can't be. If you're the Messiah, why do you have to die? Listen, at first, I didn't understand myself. Now you listen. Every day you have a different plan. First it's love, then it's the axe, and now you have to die. Keitel and I like the fact, the way Kazantzakis went through the book, that a little bit was revealed, according to Kazantzakis, as again, a fictional account, but a little bit was revealed to Jesus a little bit at a time. His journey and his job was revealed to him bit by bit. And also, what was interesting about Kazantzakis' book, as I remember now, was that Jesus didn't know he was God until this... Um, task was finally revealed to him. And he's so happy when it's finally revealed. He said, I saw Isaiah last night. He came to me and, and Judah says, what did he say? <laughs> and he says, I'm the lamb. And so in a sense, Judas plays every man because he turns to him and says, what do you mean? You're he says, I'm, I'm the lamb and I'm going to be sacrificed. I have to die on the cross. And Judas, who is interested primarily in the salvation of, of the people of, of Israel, said, well, what good is that going to do? You were supposed to lead us out of here. Now what? We found it like he represents the common man turning to a person saying, not understanding it, and voicing all that. And that's why I thought Harvey was so, was so good for this, you see. The music is very different as Peter Gabriel. It's a mixture of uh, indigenous music around the world, uh, folk music and rock and roll. Uh, the beautiful rhythms that uh, Gabriel works with, which uh, are influenced from uh, Ghana and from um, uh, Sudan and from many, many different places, Egypt and that sort of thing. Um, I also listened to a lot of Moroccan music by a group called Nas El Gawan, 
which I use part of their songs in uh, one of the scenes where Jesus is waiting for Magdalene in the courtyard uh, in her bordello. Now, you have to understand, too, in terms, though, I must say, by using Nassau Gawan, you're like, it's, it's modern Moroccan music to a certain extent, and it's just the sound I wanted. Although the lyrics that you hear at that point have been translated uh, to me, and they speak about being lost in the dark morally and spiritually. And I said it's perfect for that, for that scene. But one has to understand that it can be criticized by someone from uh, Egypt making a film about America and using... Bruce Springsteen music over uh, a scene with Abraham Lincoln. It could be incongruous, you know. But the lyrics that, that, they, uh, that I heard at that point in the picture at that time express the kind of uh, spiritual uh, struggle that I think he's going through anyway. And that's uh, what they did with this, this group, Nasa Gawan, used old instruments but with new rhythms and a mixture of new rhythms and old rhythms of old Moroccan music. And so I, I listened to a lot of their music and envisioned a lot of the designs of the film, the designs of the shots through Nasa Gawan and, uh, of course, Peter Gabriel. Well, Jesus is starting to hit his stride now. He was floundering there. Now he's... We waited half a day for these, these knife dancers to come. And they were supposed to be fantastic and do these wild things, and this was the extent of their their, their great art. <laughs> and Gabriel, I believe it's the Rhythm of the Heat, I think is the song, in which I heard these drums, and then I, I hear his voice over them. And um, that particular style that he had at the time was um, interesting to me because the drums reflected a kind of very basic, forceful humanity the flesh, in a way, and there's kind of been an ethereal sound that pervaded it, and it was more, for me, the spiritual side of it, and those two combined were very, very evocative for me. Actually, I listened to a lot of uh, his uh, live album at the time, and particularly the song on Biko, Stephen Biko, as I was listening to it, I envisioned a lot of the crucifixion scene, just by chance, it just happened that way not because of the political message, but because of the power of the music. And then the particular I Go Swimming and a bunch of other pieces of music, uh, uh, San Jacinto, a number of other pieces there, Shock the Monkey and things like that. And then a, uh, a combination of that, plus his interest in uh, rhythms from all different parts of the world, particularly Ghana and the Middle East and North Africa and that sort of thing, and how he got uh, indigenous uh, musicians to work and uh, combine their themes and their sound with um, his distillation of it, which is more of a rock medium in a way. All of this combined to make it something of an ancient time of, of a music that came out of the earth, of the beginnings of music, I thought. And uh, to dangerously skirt the issue of sensuality in the music. And to then at times not only skirt it, but embrace it as part of being what a human being is. And I thought that's why Gabriel's music is so, so important to it. In the desert, the Baptist warned us, God is coming. Well, I'm telling you, it's too late. By the time we got to shoot the uh, temple scenes there, we were hit with so many hailstorms and uh, such bad weather that I remember becoming very upset uh, in despair because I had to uh, have the Romans surround the temple. And um, basically, we had five men. They were stuntmen from Rome. Of course, I devised a way. Again, these shots were drawn earlier, and I figured a way to do it, which was... If you see the five men coming up from behind uh, one, of the, one of the buildings or one of the walls, five men appear. And then the camera flash pans, and you see another five, and flash pans, another five, and flash pans, another five. You get the sense of being surrounded. But, of course, it's the same five men. So that, again, is a Roger Corman technique. <laughs> well, I guess uh, even before Roger, I mean, the old silent days and, and people just inventing film where they had no, they just didn't have enough people. So, you know, I think Robert Aldrich did it with the one tank in the movie Attack, where we had the same tank approaching, coming around, and you, you swear it was, a, it was a whole bunch of tanks. And it was, I think, a trick of Mussolini, too. He would uh, put on display the Italian Air Force, from what I understand, in which he'd see one or two planes uh, go by uh, a grandstand with people uh, watching it, the dignitaries. And the same planes would go around and come around again. And it looked like a lot of planes. So, <laughs> But it was the idea. It was really the idea of it. And um, I remember getting quite upset about it because I was reading the reviews at that point of Empire of the Sun and The Last Emperor and... They had so many people in those films, and I said, oh, maybe I, maybe I just forced myself to do this movie 
obviously when we put it together in 87, we had a 52 day shooting schedule. We had $7 million all in to make the picture all in, including people's salaries and everything. And I said, maybe I was just too anxious to make it and I should have waited till I had more money. But Michael Ballhouse looked at me and said, no, this is the way this film has to be made. And he said, don't, don't forget that. He said, we have to do it this way. That's the way the cards are falling. That's the way we should do it. Now, come on, let's, let's get going. Said, yeah, you're right. I've just got depressed for a little while, about 20 minutes there in the morning. One of the things you notice when you watch this movie is the same extras. Jesus has like the same 30 extras that follow him for three years. It's probably about the same two centurions over and over again. Those are the kind of budget restrictions we were working with. But it seems like that was a good restriction. It made it a particular event happening in a particular town. It wasn't like this massive, faceless, huge mythical event it was an event that became mythical later you know human human proportion the strongest scene i think is the scene between jesus and judas in the film where judas uh, is finally told by jesus that he has to uh, betray jesus that's that uh, wonderful line of cousin zarkas uh, i may be quoting it incorrectly but it's uh, jesus saying that's why i got the easier job to do to be crucified you got the hard one and um, Judas can't believe he has to go through with it. But Judas is the key element, according to Cousin Zacchaeus, to the sacrifice. He's the key element which creates the setting for the Messiah to become the Messiah. And that's why Judas is the only one who can get Jesus out of the temptation at the end. No He's the only one who can get him out of that bed. Remember, we're so one of the main reasons why I wanted to do the picture was because Unless this gave me a more interesting view, I thought, of what it could have been like in the relationship between Jesus and Judas. All we know from the Gospels is the fact that Judas uh, did it for 30 pieces of silver and may have been jealous or something. For whatever it is, it's a mechanism, it's a plot device that gets Jesus on the cross. And it's very important. So it's an interesting way of looking at it, I thought. And it just makes you think about the people and about the time and about what it is to be a Christian and what love really is and what compassion really is. Because Judas has to do it out of love. And that's the biggest test, you see. It's easy to be violent, uh, but when you gotta do something out of love, when you have to live every day that way, it's, I think, the most difficult thing in the world. I think, but that's only me. I am going to die. But after three days, I'll come back in victory. You can't leave me. You have to give me strength. The three main characters are Jesus, Magdalene, and Judas. And uh, Judas as a sort of shadow figure for uh, Christ. And uh, that comes from the book, where um, the notion is that uh, Judas is necessary to complete uh, the divinity of Christ, and therefore He's a valuable function rather than a betrayer. He's the one who, who escorts Christ to the decision that he has to make. And that, we thought, was a fascinating character and a fascinating dilemma. And then we started building up the Judas from the book into a member of the, um, the Jewish sect at the time, or the group of men who were, who were revolutionaries. But taking at Cousin Zarkas' angle on it, the most important relationship which we think is true between Jesus and his apostles. The one who was, was most important was Judas because of the bond between the two and because he was asked then to go ahead and turn him in. And without turning him in, without that mechanism, you wouldn't have the sacrifice and you wouldn't have the Redeemer. Another thing that is often conveniently forgotten about uh, Judaic times, uh, the times of the prophets and uh, this era. And these are very bloody times. You know, the temple was awash with blood on the Sabbath. And uh, in our hygienic era, you know, though that's one of the many uh, revisionist uh, ideas we have about early Christianity. But that I remember was one of my uh, footnotes in my sub-document to the script 
was was actually how many animals were slaughtered and how thick the blood was, and that they had a whole drainage system. And even with the drainage system, the priests would be up to their ankles in blood by mid-Sabbath. I think that's just uh, the relic of uh, Christian upbringing, which in fact uh, is pretty much, I think, a thing of the past. I think, you know, even though everybody in this country, a large percentage of them claim to be Christian, uh, I think the, the whole blood and violence aspect of the Christianity has been softened out now. And it's much more of a touchy-feely kind of religion. And uh, which is why the Bible is actually a rather uncomfortable document uh, for some people. You know, one of the uh, songs that I sang as a child in church, you know, the chorus was washed in the blood, washed in the blood. And this whole idea of uh, being washed in blood uh, is one that uh, is played down now. This bread is my body. It is a blood cult, and there, uh, Christianity is a blood cult, and, and there is uh, argument to criticize it for this. And when I say it's a blood cult, I essentially mean that Judaism was founded on the idea of, of sacrifice, the sacrifice of animals, and the pouring of blood, uh, which would uh, atone for sins. Now drink this wine. Pass the cup. This wine is my blood. The revolution of Christianity from Judaism was that this blood could now become symbolic. It could have been shed once in the personage of Christ, of God's own son. But that doesn't mean it's still not a blood cult. It just means that the blood doesn't have to be shed every week. But it's still the shedding of blood that washes away sins. And uh, the fount of Emmanuel's blood will wash our sins. And therefore, you know, particularly in uh, Roman Catholic iconography, the whole issue of blood still remains very prevalent. And so that to call Christianity a blood cult, is, you know, is a little uh, clever and a little sort of snippy. But, it, you know, it's by and large true. <laughs> it's sort of interesting with this Heaven's Gate group. You know, people talking about them as a cult. Well, this was also a cult, you know. Uh, the difference between Christianity and other cults was that it served such a vital sociological uh, and ideological need at the time. It swept through culture like a wildfire and attracted the best and brightest minds of the times who were then able to codify it into a working religion. All of you. Something the X-Files religions don't quite have. Of course, this is based on the Katzenzakis novel. But I mean, basically, some of these events that are so familiar, if you're brought up in, in the West, I mean, you see the scene, you recognize it. Basically, you want to be faithful to the spirit of the event, but you don't want to turn it into a museum piece that makes it not mean anything for you, doesn't let you in, and you don't want to lay something on top of it that um, puts your agenda or puts a spin on it. You know, it's basically to try to find the truth in the scene, your sense of the truth. Well, well um, uh you know, once you get over the fact that he's not as Semitic as he should be, uh, it's an extraordinary performance. You know, often you write uh, 
a scene or two in a script that you think may be unplayable, they're just too difficult to play. But at least they will inform the rest of the script and they'll give the actor something to strive for. And uh, I wrote such a scene in Raging Bull that De Niro just uh, did not want to play. And uh, I felt in this there were a couple scenes that were nearly unplayable. One was the Garden of Gethsemane because basically Jesus has to go in there, get on his knees, and the audience knows exactly what he's going to say before he says it. He's going to say, please take this cup from me. And, you know, how do you play a scene where the audience is so far ahead of you and such a, a famous bit of dialogue? You know, it's like the problem in doing Hamlet. How do you do to be or not to be and, and still make it uh, fresh? So uh, I, I was really, really uh, impressed with the way uh, Willem pulled that off. Is there any other way? You're offering me a cup, but I don't want to drink what's in it. Please, take it away. Please, stop. You know, originally this was written, again, with De Niro in mind. But De Niro didn't want to play it. Uh, and as he said at the time, he said, no one will believe me in a sheet. And uh, uh, I suspect maybe he was right. Although I, I would have liked to see him take up the challenge. The relationship between Scorsese and I on this film, as on the other films we did, was not of uh, two men in a room exchanging ideas and coming to a consensus. You know, essentially, I would provide a strong story structure and a strong theme, something that uh, would hold up no matter what happened uh, along the line in terms of casting or performance or the practical exigencies of shooting. As a writer, even for the things I write for myself, I do not see the writer's job as painting pictures, but rather painting themes and structure and character. You know, because writing and directing are really two different sides of the brain. There are different forms of thinking. The idea of a word representing an image and the image itself represents two different forms of thought. The camera was constantly moving, I think, and uh, it's to create this unsettled feeling and this feeling that it could be chosen and picked out of a crowd in any second. You know, no peace. The idea of Jesus being tortured, which was kind of interesting to us. And I, that's, I guess, one of the things that, that uh, drew me to the story. And as I said recently in Los Angeles, like my old parish priest, Father Principe, uh, whom I grew up with in my early teens and was a great role model for me, has seen my pictures over the years and you know he uh, he feels uh, my movies are basically too much good friday not enough easter sunday so you know uh i think he's right we've always been looking for that resurrection but uh i keep i keep being stuck i think in the imagery and the iconography of the church particularly where we are right now today's holy saturday while we're doing this yesterday was good friday tomorrow's easter sunday um very strong imagery and uh, something that just uh, doesn't escape me and I, I guess i'm still stuck there and maybe one day i get out of it i don't know but uh, he's absolutely right about that too much good friday not enough easter sunday you know there's a tendency to take yourself too seriously about this sort of stuff but uh, the idea is i can't help it i am attracted to this version of a jesus the tortured one the one who doesn't want to deal with the enormity of the task of being uh, a messiah and a redeemer and this comes from Cousin Zakis, and this led, this gave us the indication of, uh, of how to do pretty much every camera move in the picture. Most people were around all through the shoot. David, of course, came in to do his Pontius Pilate business, uh, you know, in about two days. We rehearsed, and then we shot his stuff in one day. 
I mean, as soon as he puts on those robes, he ceases to be David Bowie, what can I say? He's slightly cynical, and he's just saying, look, uh, get pragmatic about this. Don't take a dive. I think that's a pretty traditional approach. No. I'm not a trained animal. I'm not a magician. Hmm. That's disappointing. Back in 1983, we originally cast Sting. And um, I think um, part of what we did was something that William Myler did in uh, the writer's uh, of uh, Ben-Hur, and that was that the Jewish in uh, Ben-Hur were played by Americans, and the Romans were played by British, just for a change in accent. And so we did the same here. You're more dangerous than the Zealots. Do you know that? That wasn't necessary to imply anything in any derogatory way towards the British, but the it gave us a clear change in accent, a very precise change in accent, different from the accents of the apostles. As I said, some were Canadian, some were from uh, Brooklyn, some were from uh, California. And of course, Harry Dean Stanton being more from the South, American South, or the Southwest. And um, this is a very different uh, accent, and it's the British accent, and they had to play Romans. And so we, we uh, felt um, Punch's pilot should be young and imperious in a way, and have a certain charisma. Um, did a lot of research on Punch's pilot. He was very tough as a governor. He did exist. We know they just discovered some archaeological evidence of that about 10 years ago, eight years ago. I think in Caesarea and Israel. But in any event, five or six years later, Sting was not available. I'm, I'm a great fan of David Bowie and asked him if he would do it. And uh, he said he would. And so he came down to McNess for about three days. And we had a leather toga created for him. And basically wanted to do the scene with Punch's pilot in such a way that was, again, very different from the biblical epics in that when... Jesus is crucified to the Romans, it's another criminal, another political criminal. There's no one really that special. I mean, yes, he had a following, uh, religious following, but it was a combination in their eyes, the Romans, as being problematic as a, as a revolutionary, possibly, and that sort of thing. But basically, it was another criminal, so it was nothing that special. So I didn't even want him in a, uh, an official hearing. I said, well, what, if he's, what if he's in a stable checking out one of his favorite horses? And uh, he just does this as an aside, brings Jesus in, sits him down, talks to him, tells him he's going to have to kill him. In a sense that uh, you're just another of a long line of problems for us. And we're going to take care of you the same way we took care of the others. And when are you going to wise up? And that's basically, it was like a throwaway in a way. Granted, it was done during the high holy days, during the holy day of Passover, so that there were a lot of people in Jerusalem at the time. But even better for a demonstration to make a show of power, Roman power. Uh, and let's go on to the next one. From Galilee, apparently, there were a lot of rebels, a lot of rebellious spirits who came out of Galilee. More come, we'll do the same. And they did, until 70 AD, when they destroyed the entire place. It was just one of a string of police actions that uh, this very tough governor had to do. And one that was amazing to me because of his extraordinary ability to uh, be totally courageous physically and what he was doing. He's being beat up by the Roman soldiers on a, on a real stone floor, totally naked, and uh, taking these falls. And we did about an hour, that went on for about an hour and a half. And I've seen a lot of, I've seen other people do this, but, but you know, it's one thing when you, you know, standing there preaching in Nazareth, and he knows he's going to get hit with a rubber rock in the middle of the head, right in the middle of his forehead, you know, and not blink, take after take. Actors, uh, what they have to go through and what they have, they have to pretend that they don't know a, a bullet's going to come flying at them and they're not going to jump. You know, you try, I've done it. I've tried to shoot a gun in a film in Mean Streets and I had to blink my eyes when I was shooting it. When you think of Marty, everyone always thinks of him as the actor's director because of his collaboration with great actors and his films always have great performances in and certainly his association with uh, De Niro, for example. He is a great actor's director, but that, what surprised me is not in the way that you'd think he'd be. He's uh, a dream for an actor because he gives you such a complete world and such a complete setup. Maybe it's specific to this role, but in many, many ways I felt so guided by him and felt so protected and so um, excited by what we were doing. But there was very little discussion. <laughs> when I think back on it, everything became very practical. There was a logic to it. That doesn't always mean simple, but you knew 
what you had to do and you did it. So I always like being in that situation because then, then what you do has a certain kind of confidence and velocity and directness. And in this, uh, it's because he just gives you such a perfect setup that uh, you don't feel yourself consciously making choices. You just feel yourself doing, having the appropriate responses to things. Heavy. I prefer that. I think they had a heavy one and a light one, but you might as well take the heavy one, then you don't have to worry about acting it. Then it's just heavy. <laughs> And the crucifixion and the carrying of the cross in the street comes directly from a painting by Bosch that uh, Morris showed me as a famous painting now. And, uh, but we literally tried to compose it exactly the same way. Uh, rather different, rather difficult to do in a uh, 1 to 5 aspect ratio. But, you know, we, we tried. Originally, when Morris Levin was on the film, he showed me some um, reproductions, some paintings of Rembrandt and Georges de la Tour and Caravaggio. And um, we employed that lighting and somewhat the compositions as much as possible in the Last Supper sequence, the Passover. Uh, but there was no doubt that um, uh, Boris kept trying to train my mind to look at light a certain way um, that Michael Ballhaus ultimately achieved, I think, particularly in the Last Supper and the number of other scenes at that point, at that part of the film. There are certain constraints here, time, time and, and uh, certain sets and ideas of the way I wanted the ancient world to look. We were not able to, to fully get, for example, when you do the crucifixion scene, as I say, all those shots were designed, but I had originally designed for three days shooting, 80 to 90 setups. It became two days shooting and we had to have countless meetings, myself, Barbara Defina, Joe Reedy, my assistant AD, uh, assistant director, uh, Michael Ballhaus, Laura Fattori, uh, production manager, in the little trailer we had uh, to cut down the, the setups and to see exactly what I needed. And what we did was we cut them down to 55 setups in two days. Dropped a day. And what we did at the crucifixion was literally every shot that we took was based on a drawing and a note, a notation. And we got there and it was darkness. And the moment light hit, a little squeak of light coming through, a little, little, little shaft of light, we started shooting. Even if it didn't match, didn't matter. And we literally gave ourselves a time limit for each shot. And some shots, 10 minutes. Another shot, 15 minutes. Father, I'm sorry for being a bad son. This whole experience of being on the cross I want to say something like you have a Pavlovian response to it. I've never been on a cross before, but somehow you are very strong, no matter how you're brought up, you have strong associations to that cross. And when you're, when you assume the position, those associations, you become the object of those associations. And it's a very moving and strange experience. It's like, let's say, a particular body pose is uh, associated with pain or humiliation. You assume that pose and create a little fiction around it, and you feel that quite deeply. And the fact that it's lifted off the ground and you're like floating in space in a uncomfortable pose is an odd, odd experience. See, I look at that now and I don't even recognize my, you know, it's beyond me, you know, because it's such a familiar image. This was quite uncomfortable because um, I'm sitting on a little seat and uh, my feet and my arms, there's big U-bolts that go around my feet and my arms and then there's a false front put on my, uh, on my you know, wrists and on my legs. And since it involved hardware, and since getting the cross took some time, um, 
once they got me up, they had to shoot very quickly because to hold this pose and you are holding it, it's like an incredible isometric. And after a while, I'd start to um, uh, shake. So it was difficult. <laughs> it was difficult to, um, you know, to get stuff done because always when you get ready for a shot, you think you're already you're ready, and then there's always adjustments to make. So sometimes I was up there for uh, longer than uh, I would have liked to have been. See, what they could do is they could bring a ladder around and then undo my feet, and then I could take some weight off. But up there, under my own strength, maybe, I can't remember, maybe 15 minutes at a time or something like that. It's also strange because you're nude, and uh, Moroccan culture is not used to nudity, so it was, there was always a strange tension. Once he got up there, he said, I can maybe do a minute, minute and a half. So, but after that, I can't breathe anymore. And uh, we would immediately get the ladder and bring him right down, you know. And he said, I couldn't imagine. He said, maybe you lasted maybe, what, five or six minutes? And at that point, you'd have to lose your mind. There's no way you could stay uh, composed in any way, obviously. Uh, he said, there's no way that you could endure it. It must have been so horrible. The longest time that we gave for one shot was the shot where the camera goes sideways when he yells, Father, why have you forsaken me? At that point, we were going to do 45 minutes on that shot. We did an hour, maybe a little over an hour, mainly because Michael Bolas couldn't see. When the camera went sideways, he had to trust that the composition was all right. He couldn't put his eye to the eyepiece. And we just fought and fought and fought until the very last beam of light was gone for the rest of the day. And Michael Bolas taught me how to do that uh, because he did it with Fassbender in a movie called Beware of the Holy Whore where Fassbender fired the actor after a few days of shooting, and he wanted to reshoot the whole picture in three days. And so they did it. It was like, it was like guerrilla filmmaking. It was the only way we could do it. Um, based on archaeological evidence, the only, only archaeological evidence of a crucifixion, which we read about in uh, Biblical Archaeology Review, we, we had the body positioned the same way and that sort of thing. But anyway, I mean, it was all within. Every time he's on the cross, I was only able to get him up there a minute, minute and a half, just for the length of the shot, and have a ladder right by him, bang, right off the ladder. Uh, but again, the man's doing it naked, you know. He, he, was, uh, he never complained and was always uh, able to, to deal with his body in such a way that the whole body was in the role, you know. This was so amazing about the guy. Again, now, when you get into The Last Temptation itself, this again is directly from the book, Cousin Zakis' idea. And um, in the book, uh, the devil is not a uh, little girl, it's a little boy. And... Uh, Ultimately, though, I felt that the imagery was, uh, if not a kind of imagery that has been overused over the years, had other implications to it that I didn't think were quite right. And so I wanted to give something a little more interesting, a little more original, I thought. And um, at first we thought, originally 1983, he was a very old man, like a father figure. And I remember casting Lou Ayres in it, uh, the great actor, who was glad to do it at the time. And that, as I said, that, that section of the film fell through, and we rethought it completely. And the thought of a little girl, actually, somebody who's very sweet, who takes him through all this. And we cast that young girl from uh, uh, casting sessions in London, uh, actually from videotape. All the pain, that was real. Yes, but there won't be any more. You've done enough. The idea of this carpenter that's given this awesome task in his consideration of it. It's a very uh, romantic role for me. The historical figure of Jesus is a fascinating, heroic uh, figure. He's a revolutionary. He's a, a preacher of really incredible ideas that are important to me. The power of love, the power of forgiveness. So when this film was proposed to me, I knew in order to do it, I would be steeped in a frame of mind that would address those things. So, of course, I'm approaching it as an actor, but a lot of stuff from doing this movie stays with me. Just working on it became kind of an intense meditation on some of his teachings. 
it did become a spiritual exercise. On some level, performing is always a spiritual exercise. But um, this was on all levels, consciously and unconsciously. Because when you enact these things, whether you like it or not, certain ideas and certain sensations insinuate themselves into, you know, even your subconscious. Uh, I don't want to get too pat about this, but uh, there were some incredible experiences uh, in making this film where there was a clarity and uh, through the pretending a, a kind of special way of saying. This is very beautiful, this area, uh, Meknes. Of course, we, we shot all the film in Morocco, but this Meknes is it's almost alpine. Even the houses look more like chalets than they do, you know, traditional Moroccan houses. Very lush area in the north. The notion that if, if Jesus is a metaphor for our struggle to become divine, then he has to incorporate all of those human elements of uh, temptation. And that makes uh, a lot of people uncomfortable because they love to say that Jesus is human, except when it gets to certain areas. That becomes a very sort of convenient hobby horse, uh, that uh, humanity, divinity. He's divine when it's more convenient for him to be divine. He's human when it's more convenient for him to be human. So the human Christ is the one who suffers the little children to come on to him. And the divine Christ is the one that uh, does miracles and makes pronouncements. But uh, it's a little difficult to think of him as both all the time. And uh, this has been a subject of uh, great contention from the onset of Christianity. I mean, I knew that people would get agitated and there would be you know, a fair amount of argument about it. But I came from a background where argument and heated debate on religious issues was considered uh, part and parcel of the process of being a Christian. You know, it was always a sort of a good thing to get a good argument going. But it's different, you know, a verbal argument is much different than a visual one. And the moment you see Christ having human lust is a lot different than saying he hasn't. <laughs> Ultimately, The Last Temptation is about living life quietly as a human being, raising a family, uh, having the joys and the sorrows of life of a human being. And part of that includes sexuality. And I think you have to show something of the sexuality, not necessarily graphic, but something of the sexuality as part of the temptation of being a real human being. Part of life involves sexuality, and that has to be dealt with. It has to be shown a certain way in the picture. And I think we were able to do it, I think, in as simple a way as possible without it drawing too much attention to itself. But apparently to a lot of people, just the very concept of doing that was problematic. But I thought it was important. I don't even know if in the book the particular sex act is described between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. But um, I think as part of being a human being, uh, we had to show that he lives through it and he experiences that. But that wasn't the last temptation. The last temptation was to be a real human being. This moment, which of course, being a moment of sexual unification, it's also a moment of spiritual unification. This is Jesus physically becoming part of the world of man and, and woman. But of course, this is all happening in his mind, which we don't know until the end. That didn't stop anyone from objecting to it or totally overlooking the point that we were trying to make. He was giving himself over to the hand to the hands of his destiny. If you are God or part of the Godhead, what is the one thing that you can't have? Humanity. And so what is the one thing that you yearn for? Humanity. 
I thought this was a glorious and beautiful notion of cosmetocasis. And although we knew that the realization of real life would be willfully misunderstood by some people and might scandalize a few people, I think we had no notion of the vehemence of the misunderstanding. The idea of using Jesus as a metaphor is, is, you know, technically blasphemous. You know, I didn't admit this when the controversy was going on, but, uh, you know, that would be an argument for blasphemy. And several of the more acute uh, biblical scholars and theologians pointed this out, but most of the kind of pop uh, commentators somehow associated nudity and sexual temptation with blasphemy, which is not a, the definition of the word at all. You know, you have to understand that most of the people who uh, attacked the movie didn't bother to see it. You know, perhaps rightly so, because uh, their attack really wasn't based on the film itself, but the idea of the film. There was never an attack on the film where there wasn't all, it wasn't combined with an appeal for money. You know, one of the easiest ways to raise money is to say Hollywood is against our Lord. We are defending our Lord. Please send money to help us in this fight. So it was an economic engine for those who were opposed to the film. I'm not saying that they had purely cynical motives, but it certainly helps when uh, you can latch on to a cause that uh, not only brings you media attention, but it also brings you income. We didn't throw this out into the theaters for people to be upset, you know. I believe certain things about Christianity and about Jesus, and I think it's just as valid as the uh, person who is, uh, believes in the fundamental word of the gospel. I know lots of priests who are for this picture, lots of priests who are not. I'm a Roman Catholic, and very often, even though we have stipulations of dogma, there's lots of discussion, open discussion about relationship of God to man, vice versa, et cetera, Jesus, all of this, or the nature of Jesus, lots of discussion. It's discussion. Ultimately, dogma rules in that sense, but the idea is open to discussion and to use the theater the same way as you use a book, you see. So it's disappointing to me that a lot of people didn't get to see it because of a group of people who believe a certain way. That's all. Now, I'm not condemning what they believe. I'm not condemning, I'm not saying that, well, that their way is wrong. I'd say, that, well, that's the way they want to do it, fine. But let other people do it the way they, they want to do it, you know? Let other people try to see something and um, uh, maybe it'll spark an idea in somebody's head, maybe something will happen, maybe some people, as I know for a fact, a lot of people have written me letters about the film, whatever, have felt very good about it and, and uh, gotten through some bad times in their own lives. In any event, we were kind of surprised by the uh, notoriety of the piece, you know, what happened, that's all. But uh, as I say, uh, something I felt I had to do and I, I, I did it and while I was doing it I even knew I'm never going to be satisfied with it but that was what the process was Come with me. I didn't think it was going to be such a uh, big controversy but again I sort of work in a vacuum I believe in this stuff see like even today I don't read very many newspapers uh, I don't see new films that much, so I kind of work by myself in a vacuum, and I just try to remain true to what I was trying to say with the film, basically try to remain true to what the concepts Cousin Zakis had, which excited me in the first place. It isn't that you make a film like this with love. It is love. You can't wake up before dawn and know that the camels aren't right and the, uh, <laughs> you know, we can't get to location because the road has been washed out and things like that without loving it, you see. And I guess I'm spoiled that way. And most of the pictures I've made in the past 25 years are pictures that I really believed in. Other times I've done a couple of pictures where I just tried to work as a director. You know, I find that very hard and I always say that I'm very lazy because I'm not really an old fashioned director. I would have liked to have been one. But this is a good example of being like on this embarrassingly intense mission too, <laughs> as far as I was concerned, and Harvey too, and a bunch of others, a bunch of Barbara and uh, Barbara Hershey, uh, Willem, all of us, to make this picture and uh, we really believed in it. But uh, we were very disappointed when uh, 
a very small percentage of people in America were able to skew it in such a way that a lot of people refused to see the film and that a place like Blockbuster Video to this day does not stack this picture in its racks. This, this country is supposed to be able to say what you want to say. It's a free country to do that. What they did by being so vociferous about it and so loud about it and so strident about it was to um, make people afraid to go to a theater to see it. In other parts of the world that happened, it doesn't, it's not under the American system. It's a little different. In France, it was probably the worst uh, reactions. Theaters were bombed, or sort of, from what I understand, but for extremely right-wing groups. But this is not France. This is America. And it's a pity that um, they were able to hold back uh, the distribution of the picture and that sort of thing. The idea of living with Mary and Martha, which comes from the book, by the way, Cousin Zaka's book. But one of the things I, I thought I understood was the idea of being in isolated places in the world where uh, certain laws provide for polygamy or for, I think it's the law of Levite in the Old Testament, where I may have this wrong, but um, if um, a woman is married to a man and he's got a brother and the man dies, she has to marry the brother. It's for the continuation of uh, the bloodline and survival. This is where Cousin Zakas was coming from, I think, in making that such a, an important section of the, the Last Temptation itself. Different rules apply in different parts of the world, uh, especially in um, less populated parts of the world. Still, though, you can say, well, it's just the Last Temptation. It didn't have to be that way. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe Cousin Zakas was dealing there with uh, the idea of sexuality and how it affected uh, Jesus as a, uh, as a human being, as a man, at that point when he's no longer God, he's man supposedly in this last temptation, which is all an hallucination, by the way, right? We know that. We know, as Paul Schrader said at the end of the South Bank show on this film, what are they gonna get upset about? And Schrader says, the dirty parts. And I guess he's right, you know? But that's part of being human. And it's part of how you see things. People see it, it's not dirty, <laughs> you know? But uh, um, when you're dealing with um, with this issue, it's uh, I felt we had to show it. And I felt we had to go along with what Cousin Zakas was doing with Mary and Martha. I tend to think of it, maybe I'm just rationalizing it, but I tend to think of it as Lot and his two daughters. There's only one woman in the world. Go inside. I went with my wife to the first, to the opening day of, of the movie at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York. And there were security guards, there were people being examined, packages were being examined as if we were getting on an airplane for an international flight. The theater was full and it's a huge theater, that was very heartening. person sitting directly in front of me got up for five, ten minutes sometime in the middle of the movie and had left a package on the seat. And uh, I was so paranoid at that point that I was about to go and, and get an usher, but the person returned, sat down, and concentrated on the movie. At the end of the film, it received a standing ovation. The only time I've ever seen a paying, non-premiere, non-industry audience ever do that, stand for a movie. It was one of the great experiences of my life. I felt that I'd given a fair amount to the movie, but I knew that this was the heart and soul of my best friend. And I felt with that one reception, he'd been vindicated. We left the theater by a, a back entrance and went down a gauntlet of press and demonstrators. People shoving microphones in our faces, uh, people uh, just grabbing anyone from the audience that they could find, asking what they thought of the movie, asking what their moral opinion was of the movie, asking what their theological opinion was of the movie. Everyone that I heard being interviewed in that long gauntlet was very supportive. My wife and I headed for a telephone, found one by a subway entrance, called Marty, got him out of a dubbing session, told him about the reception the film had received. And Marty was so worried at that point and was under such intense 
public pressure and scrutiny and under threat, as we began to realize, physical threat, that when I told him that the audience had stood and applauded for the film, he may re repeat what I said five or six times. He could hear me, but he couldn't absorb it. And once absorbed, he couldn't believe it. And after all was said, after Marty spent the next year with bodyguards and bomb threats and people opening his mail, I hope it doesn't sound too glib to say that in some way that one moment of standing, of reconfirmation, made all the doubt, all the pressure, all the commercial uncertainty, all the protest, it made everything more than worthwhile. Wait a minute. When it came to casting St. Paul, I had envisioned, in a sense, a sort of revivalist preacher, in a way, and it, it was kind of in keeping with the different verbal accents of the, uh, the actors in the film. And so, thinking of a revivalist preacher, uh, the only person I could think of that would really fulfill this role uh, uh, beautifully was um, Harry Dean Stanton, because he had that fire and that charisma. Um, he had a decidedly beautiful human quality about him and uh, a great feeling of love and passion. But I, there was no doubt that it was a, um, an allusion to um, a certain style of uh, behaving in worship. Uh, that was one of the reasons for casting Harry. What's the matter with you? This is the echo of John Ford and the man who shot Liberty Valance here. As was said very memorably in that film, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. And here in the character of Paul, you can see the, the legend of Jesus begin to take shape. I created the truth out of what people needed and what they believed. If I have to crucify you to save the world, then I'll crucify you. And if I have to resurrect you, then I'll do that too, whether you like it or not. I won't let you. I'll tell everyone the truth. <laughs> Go ahead. Go on. Tell them now. Uh, Paul uh, was an extraordinary man in that he crossed the known world four times by foot and almost single-handedly created this religion. But on the other hand, he was also a poet. We don't, we don't know that much about Jesus except through the filter of Paul. We know we're learning more every year as, it, as documents surface. But uh, certainly in terms of making the great synthesis between the Greek Aryan thought pattern and the Judaic one, it was Paul who did this. You know, in the Greek world, there were many gods and they lived up there. Uh, and came down once in a while to fool around with mankind. And in the Judaic monotheism, there was one God, and uh, he was apart from us. And uh, Paul combined these two notions in the idea that he, the Godhead, the, the Trinity, and then he slapped a nice heavy dose of social reform onto it by saying the incendiary thing that if you believe in this man, Jesus of Nazareth, you will sit beside your master in heaven, i.e. that Christianity is the great democratic equalizer of all humans and that it is an anti-class system. Well, that was an idea that spread like wildfire. And, and literally, that's what brought down, the, uh, brought down Rome was the force of that idea. It's a matter, I think, of... Uh trying to make it as original as possible, we thought, The Last Temptation itself. As original and as dreamlike, too. I and mean, you cut at a certain point, and he's aged. You cut finally at another point, and it says that Jesus at 72 years old, looking straight towards the camera. And that's the scene where the angel uh, talks to him and says, I hope you've been satisfied with everything so far. And he says that wonderful line that Schrader wrote, I'm, I sh I'm ashamed when I think of it, all the wrong ways I look for God. And I thought it was so beautiful. And then you hear a woman scream, and Jerusalem is burning which was a hard scene to do. We didn't have any Jerusalem. We didn't have any fire. We had some smoke. 
and it isn't easy. It, those aren't di- easy lines to do, uh, easy dialogue for people to be running up and down, yelling Jerusalem's on fire. So <laughs> we had to find ways to do that. We were able to use uh, people's voices in New York, um, a number of people, Peggy Gormley was one of the actors, and a number of others, and uh, uh, Eliana Douglas uh, uh, put a lot of those lines in. Uh, some of the screams, too, were quite good, and she came up with. And it all had to be constructed, uh, phrase by phrase and everything, to create a kind of dreamlike effect for the entire last 15, 20 minutes of the film, which is The Last Temptation. The world of God is the world of Earth. The singular brilliance of this notion, of course, comes from Kazantakis. Marty would often make me groan when we got to a script problem. He would say, now let's open our books and read what he did in the novel. Uh, I confess I always thought the novel was a, a little overextended and even sometimes kind of overheated. But there was no getting around the lucidity and power of Kazantakis's perception that the ultimate temptation for God could be the beauty of the life that we all take for granted. Get out of the way we were sent here. You know, Kazantakis, to, to my recollection at this point, you know, the two strong th- threads in the book uh, are the Eastern mystical and the Nietzschean. And the Nietzschean involves the notion of the striver and the Ubermensch overcoming doubt and rising to some level of uh, self-purification. The Eastern element involves much more of a merging concept. Uh, The film does go more to that Western, that Nietzschean uh, take on uh, Christianity. And uh, some scholars of Kazanzaki uh, have objected to that, and I think that's a fair objection. You have the best shepherd because you had no sheep. Oh, Rabbi, I missed you. My religious background in, in Dutch Calvinism is essentially a kind of thinker's religion. Calvin believed you could sort of think your way into heaven, and therefore he tried to. Uh, reduce faith to a pinhole and construct a huge logical wall around it. The fallacy in this being that a pinhole of faith is the same size of faith. Once you allow faith into the argument, it can no longer be purely logical. In uh, Marty's kind of urban Roman Catholic view, much more weight was given to uh, the imagistic, uh, the emotional, and the impressionistic aspects of uh, Catholicism, the iconography, the candles, the ritual. In my background, churches more or less looked like courtrooms, and ministers stood up and lectured you. He hears you. He just won't say anything. He's been fighting in Jerusalem. Look at his hands. There's still blood on them. Judas, the master is speaking to you. Answer him. Traitor! We actually thought that the fact that Judas is the backbone of Jesus would scandalize as many people as anything else in the film, anything of a more sensual nature. But in fact, because of the free-reigning puritanism that prevails over much of America, this business of this radical approach to the character of Judas took a kind of a back seat. I don't understand. Understand? Rabbi. You broke my heart. What's wonderful is Judas is so filled with hunger for to do the right thing. Judas is such a righteous character. 
and Harvey's so perfect for it, <laughs> because uh, Harvey has a nobility about him with uh, uh, terrific flaws as well. Not cool, I'm talking about his uh, screen persona. At the time of the fall of Jerusalem, the end of the story, when Peter uh, and Judas return uh, and accuse of him of being a betrayer, you know, he says, but uh, my angel told me, and, and then uh, Judas reveals the angel to, in fact, be the tempter from the desert. Well, a couple things had to get changed here from the script. In my script, I, I adhered to the notion in the book that it was this little Arab boy. And uh, Marty, for whatever, whatever reason, political or personal, was uncomfortable with that. And so that got changed to a sort of angelic young girl. And then at the end, when Judas points out the true nature of this angel, uh, the angel transforms. And I actually, in the script, had it sprouting, you know, black wings and so forth. Marty either tried it and said it was a hoot, it didn't work, or he never even tried it. But the end result was that it became uh, the flame from the desert. What angel? Look at her. When he begins to understand that the little angel was really a devil, um, I had tried other things. I had tried a skull figure and... Um, uh, sort of a death muppet, in a way, and we, it didn't work. It looked like you know, uh, spooks on the loose or something, you know, with uh, Bella Lugosi and the Bowery Boys, and uh, it just didn't didn't work at all. And so we just simply said, well, let's go right back to the fire and cut straight back to the um, the column of fire. But then it's, it's not that easy to shoot a column of fire. I mean, I tried it in different speeds, so that. I got higher speed, and it was in slower motion, the, fly, the fire, so it was more seductive. But then even that wasn't quite right, so I double-framed that in the printing. I made it even more, I thought, seductive in a way, um, slower-looking, you know, more insidious, I thought. Anyway, that was part, again, the philosophy of making the picture for $7 million all in, keeping the uh, costumes down, uh, keeping it all. It was part of, part of the poor people of the time. It was part of... Uh, scaling down of the project to, a, I think, a more realistic level and dealing with only the elements. And the other thing that I thought was very, very difficult was uh, when uh, in 70 AD, when uh, Jerusalem is burning and uh, Jesus uh, asked God to uh, forgive him and put him back on the cross, I uh, just didn't know how any actor could really do that. And I thought Willem pulled it off and I thought it was phenomenal. The scene where where Jesus asked to be put back on the cross was very difficult because I knew it was an important scene and I was never conscious of that before. And I was also wondering how uh, emotional it would be. And I was kind of spent toward the end and I remember it was kind of like, I didn't want to have it be about crying or breaking down or anything like that. But at the same time, it had to have a certain emotional commitment. So for whatever reason, I think I started anticipating the end of the film and I started standing outside of the scene and that got me into a little trouble because I wasn't just sitting in the story. And I remember um, I went up and we did the scene and it was so terrible. <laughs> it was really hokey and bad and artificial and Marty just looked at me and he uh, didn't know really what to say except for get up there. And he said something like, well, that's not, not, not exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> and somehow, it's hard to explain, but somehow I was so deeply humiliated by the failure and also kind of buoyed up by the fact that by this point, the best thing he could tell me was simply to go up there and do it again. <laughs> you know, it was really the best advice. It sounds moronically simple. But out of that humiliation, I had failed so miserably that it centered me once again and put me in the right frame of mind to do it. It put me back in the story. It is accomplished!
It is accomplished. Yeah, myself and Schrader, too. We, and, of course, Jay Cox, we all felt of the problem of the last line, it is accomplished. We even thought of doing it in Greek, but we finally stuck with it. I think um, Defoe's uh, physicality made it so immediate that I think it works. And not it's accomplished, not contracted, but it is accomplished. It's done. I did it. You know, I got through. And for the very last second, snatched from the jaws of hell, you know, that sort of thing, like, like a lot of people feel <laughs> in life. But, uh, but that was the idea. In the beginning of 1983, I had a meeting uh, about the film with uh, Barry Diller, who was the head of Paramount at the time. And he simply asked me, uh, why do you want to make this picture? And I, I sort of blurted out, um, I want to get to know Jesus better. And he sort of smiled. Uh, I don't, know if it was the, I don't know if it was the answer he was expecting. I don't know if it was even the answer I was expecting, but that's pretty much the impulse to make the movie. Uh, for, for better or for worse, that was the impulse. Maybe, that also may reflect my arrogance at the time. I think I had to be put in my place, so to speak, in order to be able to try to attempt to make this picture. <laughs> you know, I don't mean that Paramount puts you in your place. I don't mean that the studio, I'm talking about something happening inside and... Uh, God making work out in such a certain way that if you're going to be this way about it, you're not going to get to make it. You need to, you need to grow a little more somehow. And even when you do that, it's not going to be right. <laughs> and I'm not excusing it either. I'm saying, saying, oh, we didn't finish it in time. We didn't have enough money. Whatever. No, a film, even if you have enough money very often, um, you're only able to get a certain thing that you want on screen, maybe. And it's not A for effort. You know, we had this in mind. The audience doesn't know what you had planned. They don't know that the actor was sick that day. So you have no excuses. I mean, there is no excuse. I had to know that. And really trying to make this picture, I had to go through an experience which uh, basically was tantamount to my whole life being changed by the end of 83 and plug being pulled, pulled on a picture. But not only that, a whole career. A whole career. It was, it was very hard to get the movies that I wanted to make made since then. Hollywood's gone another way. Uh, it's almost now a different industry to a certain extent with special effects films and that sort of thing. A lot of the independent film world has taken up the slack of uh, films about people, quote unquote, whatever that is, you know, <laughs> but uh, more personal films. You know what I'm saying? Well, I came out of the 70s where a lot of it was like a lot of directors were, were the boss in a way. And by 1980, with Heaven's Gate, that all ended. And so, in a sense, I had to be pushed back right back to number one and start all over again. And I think... Uh, it's kind of fitting that it was this particular project that did that because I had to see if I could survive, quite honestly. And I think that was part of the process of making this film. And you had to be humbled into the state of, um, of, I don't know, barely able to walk again and still see if you could do it. And, uh, and that's part of the process. 